Dermatology has sadly become a field where it is slightly trivialized. I have my fun, but yeah. I don't smoke. Yeah. I don't drink yes. alcohol. Now my skin has calmed down. Is this a nice general guideline for people dealing with adult acne? You know, Singapore had declared acne as a pandemic at one time. Do you or do you not recommend antibiotics nowadays? I know of children who've gone and done their lip jobs in bad places. Not just is the aesthetic outcome bad, there could be serious complications of death of a tissue. What do actors come in for? There are a lot of people I simply do biostimulatory injections. Are these things painful? Does makeup harm skin? The stress of looking good today, I think, is half the stress. If people are dealing with a lot of pimples or any skin condition, if they take a blood test, mm. will that blood test actually indicate the core problem? And I want to ask you in detail about Accutane and Isotretinoin. Got because it. globally speaking, this is one of the most popular YouTube search terms related to acne. She's considered the film industry's go-to dermat, the media industry's go-to dermat, but in the medical circles, she's considered one of the top dermatologists, not just in India, but in the world. As she said over the course of this conversation, dermatology and actually treating skin and improving skin in the long term is a lot about understanding the science and craft of dermatology. So while we've spoken about acne, pimples, dry skin, skincare routines, and the basic skincare stuff in this episode, we also went pretty deep I personally would like every single young adult, at least in India, to watch this episode till the end because you learn a lot about your own skin. You learn a lot more about skincare than a 10-minute video can teach you. And you'll be left with weapons for life. I understand that all of us are basically dealing with some sort of skin issues. Your answers are packed into this introductory episode with the legendary Dr. Rashmi Shetty. She's going to be back for many episodes after this. Because ladies and gentlemen, we found a TRS All-Star. But this is one of my absolute favorite biology and science episodes of the year. It's also pretty much a bit of a free of cost consultation with one of the top dermatologists in the world. So you're welcome. Just sit back, enjoy, learn, relearn, take notes because you're going to be left with a lot to absorb at the end of this episode. Enjoy yourself. This is Dr. Rashmi Shetty on TRS. You're welcome, guys. Today we have Dr. Rashmi Shetty on the show. India's top dermatologist. Uh, literally all my actor friends, my model friends, uh, and these aren't even up-and-comers. These are all established people who are so-called famous. My influenza friends. <laughs> Everyone um, has spoken about you at some point. Like your name comes up so much in like uh, at least media circles. Um, and um, the media world is generally obsessed with skin. So uh, I'm grateful to you for being on the show. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, how have you done this? Like, how do people, you know, uh, know about you so much? I'll tell you something. So when the first supermodel came to my clinic, you know, this is like 20 years ago, I and she was happy once I finished, okay? So I said, done. Now I'm going to have a line of people outside. Nothing happened. Little did I realize that that was a very hush-hush thing, right? So she, of course, did not tell anyone. And nobody else told anyone. And I had a small office, me and my one girl assisting me. Who would tell anyone, right? So that's it. Over. That was no Instagram. right? Nothing. Over. So that's it. That was the start of my one superstar walking in. Then some point things happened. People came in. And rest is history. But it didn't like say the first one came in the line. Laga. That didn't happen. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But what are you doing different as a dermatologist? Because our city is full of dermatologists. Yeah. And honestly, there's too many skincare problems nowadays. The primary one being acne. This so is what so I... True. true. And please chip in. No, like, no. Correct true, me true. Anyway. But uh, uh, especially adult acne is yeah. so common. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've dealt with adult acne a lot in my own life. Mm. And... Um, I just have always wondered at what separates a great dermatologist from a good dermatologist. So I'd like you to answer that question from your perspective. So 
in my perspective like you rightly said there is dime a dozen experts right now right dermatology has sadly become a field where it is slightly trivialized and diluted so there's something called skin expert somebody saying aesthetic physician so so many people are claiming that realm of speciality of dermatology in order to solve the problem of pimples primarily exactly okay. right from the auntie the salon to a uh, physician to everyone is trying to chip in and say we are all there so the difference then becomes one you firstly being a legitimate qualified board certified dermatologist that's number one starts from there being rightly qualified two understanding the diagnosis again today it's become more every field including medicine has become more like a business there's a target there is a running of the clinic xyz now if you can dissociate that and come back to being a pure clinician at heart where you started out from to me whether it is acne it's dermatology or cardiology your differentiation from good to great is just that remember that you're basically a clinician at heart and get to the diagnosis first and then start off with the simplest of things to help your patient could simply be lifestyle and you will see a lot of acne can simply be solved with lifestyle sleep well your acne will be solved at many times wash your scalp well your acne will be solved so to me that is what sets me apart where i get to the diagnosis start very simple and you shouldn't be dependent on your dermatologist right that's the whole thing make them independent of you at some point and you know that's the goal to start with right from the beginning hmm. uh so you primarily focus on the craft related to whatever you're growing and when it comes to actually solving skin problems you get to the root of the problem exactly and my next obvious question is at least in our city mumbai and i probably also speak for delhi bangalore because i see a lot of adult acne there as yeah. well yeah yeah uh in all the metros there's too much adult acne mm. i travel around the country for work mm. when i go to tier 2 and tier 3 there's lesser less adult acne hmm why is this happening is it because of the air is it because of the food the water um because it can't be as simple as uh, city people smoke drink and you know have a wrecked sleep cycle there's mm. got to be something which is not controllable by city people like i know some of my healthiest friends who are dealing with a lot of adult acne i'm glad you brought that up why is your healthiest friend dealing with adult acne there could be two three reasons which i've always seen the most healthiest fellows coming with adult acne one either they are on protein supplements which in excess cannot be digested by the body in an absence of carb cannot be digested by the body so it becomes really difficult and that excess protein is inflammatory so it's counterproductive to your body that's exactly when you have acne on the back acne on the face all this happening that's number one if you see a a smaller town guy who's also exercising like my cousins in mangalore are all buff shetty buff guys but they're all eating regular food to get that protein they're not pumping in protein powders that's what they do here that's number one in a lot of like you said the media guys and the healthy girls who get adult acne i have seen the main thing is excessive dieting zero fat zero carb diet and the so called keto diet and intermittent fasting not meant to your body because it it disrupts your hormone cycle you end up literally there are people who come with not even getting periods so that level of disruption to the hormone is happening obviously there's going to be acne obviously it's going to pop somewhere so therefore you see more but obvious like you said metros there is pollution there is sleeplessness there is addictions there is blah blah intoxications xyz along with it it's stress simply stress of looking good so mm. let's not look at stress as this you know major i am an achiever and i have 8 hours of working and 20 hours of something else simply stress of turning out well is a stress i see young adults going through the stress and mamas bringing young adults and saying i don't know what to do she refuses to meet people because there's acne i'm like it's acne it's fine i'll treat you that's a separate question but to start with it's fine it's acne so the stress of looking good today i think is half the stress mm okay uh you've given me 10 tangents to take you upon <laughs> uh so i don't actually know where to go with the conversation but mm -hmm. i'll probably go in the direction of myself okay, okay? uh the one thing i figured through the show by talking to a lot of doctors uh even like we've had people like uh, luke cotinio we've had like you know health experts yeah. as well 
uh, I've realized everyone's bodies are different. So true. Like, and some a food that suits someone may not suit another person. Which is why you'll see someone eating lots of cheese, drinking lots of milk, and it's fine. Their skin is glowing. And another person who has even a cup of milk or a little cheese, they get a lot of acne just because of that. I think that's the primary uh, thing I've learned about skincare that everyone's skin is different and it will get affected by your diet. And as an adult, if you're dealing with adult acne, you have to figure what foods work for your body and what doesn't. And probably what diet works for your body and what doesn't. Have I said something wrong medically? No. In saying, no. Would you like to add anything to what I've said? No. You're, you're right. You're right in what you're saying. All I want to say is you're talking still about physiology and pathology, all of that coming together, microbiology, all of this coming together since we're talking science. I will tell you there is variation is something as fixed as anatomy in us. It's linear, right? Here there are 10 things which are influencing, like you said. There is food, there is lifestyle, there is another one, there is somebody coming from some region, somebody knowing to digest something else. All this is coming. Anatomy, which is more like linear, there is so much difference. Like I'm an expert with face, for example. If you cut up my face and your face, the facial artery, which is supposed to have a course like this, wow. is different in you and different in me. And there's so much percentage, which is like this, so much percentage. Which is like so that also is so much varying. How can you expect one million things that is happening to be consistent? No two people are the same. Mm. So when I said that different foods suit different people, uh -huh. uh, what you're chipping in and saying is that, yes, because even though we're the same species as human beings, Every human's anatomy, when you actually cut up the body, it's fully different. No. So I am saying something as linear as anatomy is different. But if you're sticking to food, let me make it more simpler. So if you're sticking to food, for example, you and I both have a cup of milk, right? You are Punjabi? Yes. Okay. So you have been born in North India. You have understood, your system has understood digest wheat, digest probably chana. I am a South Indian. My system does not know how to digest that. So innately, my system knows to digest rice. I won't put on weight. I eat rice every meal. I don't put on weight with rice. But you may put on weight with rice because my body knows how to digest and use it to my best possibility. Two, gut bacteria. Your microbiome is very different because you've had coffee, I've had tea, for example. You've had antibiotic yesterday, I am against pills. Various things might have made your microbiome different than mine. And again, microbiome is very important for you to digest what you're breaking, break up what you're eating. That is different. Everything is different. The way you may boil is different than the way I may boil. The cow that you're using is different than the cow that I'm using for the milk. You may put something in the milk. I may not put anything in the milk. So there is so many variations. Genetically, you may be getting acne. I may not get acne at all, no matter what I do. You may have your oil glands bigger, different. I may have oil glands differently. Your hormones are different. Mine are different nutritionally certain vitamins and fats are different in you, different in me. So there's n number of variation. That is why a glass of milk to you and a glass of milk to me will never be the same and will never give the same. So as a doctor, when multiple personalities are walking into your clinic, how do you even begin if everyone's so different? Yeah, so that is where a detailed consultation is important. I mean, there are you, you were just going back to you asking me, what's the difference between a good to great? For me, even if you have a, a demand for your time, I still don't see more than 22 to 25 patients in a day. And I work from 10 to 6 with no break, with like okay. a 10 minute break. I give a lot of time to each patient. I see the patient myself. I do have doctors working with me, but I will still be the one asking you, what is your name and age? So I will literally take a detailed history. That is where I differentiate you from another. I will go into very details from your childhood to now. What is your skin like? What is your parents' skin like? Where have you traveled and what is your... Diff I literally go through very detailed history. Okay. That is where I decide. In a lot of cases of people my age, early 90s born, I'm, I just turned 30. I still see my friends struggling with adult acne. And the big hope is that when all of us turn 35 or 40, it'll kind of reduce by itself because at least in guys, the testosterone levels will reduce a little bit. Huh. So there will be some kind Change. of conjunction. Uh, I remember my acne began at around like 14. 16, 14, yeah. Uh, it increased a lot when I started lifting weights, even yes. without, even without the weight Testosterone goes up. 
Yeah. Anyways, like with and, muscle. Yeah. Once I started taking whey protein, it went up a hell of a lot more. Uh, I did a keto phase to yeah. experiment with my body because eight years ago I was trying to go into the details of health mm -hmm. for the sake of YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I was like, before putting up content on the internet, I'm going to experiment with my own body. That was the worst my skin ever became. <laughs> um, because I, I didn't just do like a zero carb thing. I it, took it to an extreme where even the vegetables I ate, it was just leafy vegetables. My God. Because there's no uh, carbohydrate. There's very little carbohydrate yeah. in that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it wrecked my system on multiple levels, but it did the job that ketogenic diets yeah. were meant for. Like I, I got a six pack and everything. <laughs> but my skin had never been worse. Uh, I went on Accutane after that. Mm. Came out. Mm. The Accutane phase got done. A little bit of acne started coming back and that's when I realized, wait, there's something I'm doing wrong in my diet. Remove the whey protein. For me, plant proteins really worked. Yes. Uh, I switched to yes. that. It's easier to digest. Yeah. Less inflammatory. And I also noticed that through the course of my 20s, now I don't know, this is definitely my subjective reality, but I feel so many of my friends who are dealing with adult acne, I sometimes want to tell them that, hey, you know, why don't you try changing this about your diet? Because right. this is what helped me a lot. Right. But then you don't, it's rude to talk to people about their pimples. Because I have had pimples and I know what it's like when someone tries giving you advice. Yeah. Uh, but in so many cases, I see them drinking a lot of milk, yeah. uh, a, eating a lot of junk food, <laughs> specifically eating a lot of cheese. Processed food, never. Yeah. Uh, eating a lot of cheese, smoking a lot. Mm. Um, for me, again, this is, I'm not one of those people who like preach for dietary changes <laughs> and all that. Huh. But because I did a lot of yoga, I felt like my body was rejecting meat. And I, yeah. I ate a lot of meat. So first I ended up giving up red meat for a while. Then I just didn't feel like eating chicken after a point. So I gave it up and I was just listening to my own body. Uh, it was probably in conjunction with a, a, my yo, yoga based lifestyle. Hmm. Uh, I'm like pure vegetarian now. Like I even gave up eggs and I've, I'm from a hardcore non-vegetarian family who still eats like a lot of non-veg. Hmm. Uh, and I don't look at it from a moral compass or anything. I'm just purely talking about my skin journey uh, and now only at age 30 after having this like very basic diet like uh, you know diet. I'm Almost. not fully satisfied <laughs> also like as in yeah. I have my fun but yeah. I don't smoke yeah. I don't like yeah. drink alcohol yeah. uh, you know I'm the kind of guy you take home to your mother <laughs> <laughs> okay he's saying something <laughs> but uh, from a skincare uh, perspective yeah. so uh <gasps> now my skin has calmed down and I still have some trouble with yeah. skin. When yeah. I get stressed, I get acne now. See? Yeah. Uh, like that, that's what I've noticed. Yeah. That if my stress levels are through the roof, something will are. happen. So it's actually much more about handling stress, which then shows up on your face. Yeah. So if I'm doing my prana, my yoga regularly, I'm fine. Everything is fine. I'm glowing. I'm a magazine cover. And so you can take him home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. Now, whatever I said, there are two aspects to this. One, I'm showing off a little bit. I can see. <laughs> I, I, I just totally got it. <laughs> and huh. two, uh, is this a nice general guideline for Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, Kolkata, people dealing with adult acne? Okay, what so I've given them. What I will do is, since you gave me one long thing of what you did, I'm going to break it up. Sure. So it's easy for our kind of listeners to grasp from what beautifully you did. So the first thing you said is, I ended up doing keto, whatever, whatever, intermittent. So when anybody chooses a diet, you must understand the idea of diet is to heal your body, to take it a good place, not to stress your body further. Simple. So keto may, like you said, I don't know, keto might work for some people, may not work for another people. You need to realize when you start a diet, is that stressing you out? Is it causing you acne? Is your skin, maybe not everybody will break into an acne. You will get a red skin, irritated skin, chappy skin. Your eczema might become more. If you have had a psoriasis, that might become more. So the, in Diwali, my one of my, from my CA's office has psoriasis, which we are treating. Came back with new lesions because he had had a lot of sweets. So you, it could be any of the skin issues. We are talking acne, but I'm saying any of these skin issues can exacerbate with the wrong diet. Now you sit down, start your diet, See how it feels in one week. Is any disruption there? If there is, then this is not diet for you. Look for another diet. How do you figure if there's a disruption? You may end up getting an acne. You may end up getting a chapped skin. You may suddenly see hair fall. You may see folliculitis or acne on your back. You may end up, uh, like I said, exacerbating uh, eczema. 
uh, psoriasis, any of these things that you may have had and it is sitting quietly. Now you start a diet and things change. Then you know it is this. So you know that's not happening. And as a woman, along with all these things, if that month your period is disrupted, disrupted, then you kind of know, oh, there is something which led to it because there's nothing else I'm doing but starting this new diet. It only means it's stressing your body. You don't need anything which is stressing your body. Shift to another diet, shift to another diet, shift to it. You will find your peace in two, three diet forms that you have followed. So that's, I eat red meat. I am very happy. Like I said, I eat rice. I am very happy. My body knows that. If I stop all that with the kind of work I have and the concentration that I have to do and high energy I have to have even at 6 o'clock. Patient comes, I can't say, you know what, I'm tired. I don't have that full energy. I need my sustained release carb all the day. So for me, it works. So you need to find out what works for you in your giving li given lifestyle, need, goal and for your body. So that is your diet part. The next you said, I gave up uh, milk. And I see you repeating that many times through our conversation. Very important to three things that I in general tell them to give up. One is dairy and dairy products except curd, which to me is a broken dairy. There is good bacteria in it. So there is a lot of, lot of good things in that curd. So I always tell them eat curd in the afternoon because one of my Ayurveda friends said, apparently curd is difficult to digest. So I tell them not to have it at night and you have it in the afternoon. So curd is allowed and I have allowed people to have very, very buttermilk, which is already butter removed, not just diluted curd. Yeah. So that is something. And ghee are the three dairy that I allow you to have. Then I tell them to cut off all processed food. Like you said, cheese, cheese is processed. Chips, packet, whatever comes in the packet, whatever is processed, do not have. There'll be a lot of hidden things which I also won't understand. You also won't understand. So please don't have it. The other one that I, um, which includes the proteins from the packet that you have. So these are all processed food. I tell them to avoid. In fact, these are the only two, I'm thinking, these are the only two things I blanket avoid everyone. I tell them anything processed, packet, what you have to buy from outside, stop. Stop dairy. And then I move them to some other milk. Now I want to also tell the audience and people who are listening to this to say that, when I say stop dairy, dairy, I've seen people go and have a glass full of almond milk. Not happening again. There is so many almonds required to squeeze that glass full of yeah. almond milk. You're Amongst overloading. other processed things. Correct. So when you, no, when you skip to another milk, when I say no milk, you're looking for an alternate, right? What is your alternate then? Do you have an alternate? What do you do? Um, I, I primarily have black coffee now, <laughs> like or green tea. But, but if you were to have oat, milk, oat milk, very good choice. So to me, again, a vegetarian source of milk is a very good choice to have, which is oat milk is the most least in its inflammatory quality. Other than any nut milk, which will be heavy in fat, right? Why would you want to have that? Most of you who are on a diet is also trying to reduce weight. So you're having something as rich in fat. So no. The third thing that you said is how, avoiding foods. You said I avoided red meat. Most of us may not avoid the same food and get the benefit. Yeah. An easy thing to understand what might help you is when you eat something, you see what makes you bloated, what makes you uncomfortable, burpy, not happy in your system. So you know gut is not handling it. Gut is going to throw it out on the skin in the end. It's all gut is gonna, connected. Gut is going to throw it out on the skin in the end. Can, can we just pause this thing? Huh. Just talk about like this in a few sentences. Yeah. We actually had a gut expert on the show who said that there's too many nerves connected to your gut, mm. which is why they relate IBS to how your mind feels. Yeah. But I also want to know specifically, why is gut, the gut related so to important. pimples? Is it because your gut gets inflamed it's, because your body is not able to digest certain things? Yeah. That, that excess heat in your body shows up on your face. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A layman way of calling in saying inflammation is heat. Mm. That's it. What is inflammation actually, medically speaking? Medically, inflammation is anything that disrupts your body. For example, to put it simply, let's say pollution, wrong food, causes uh, inflammation and free radical damage. What is free radical damage? Free radical damage is um, rogue oxygen species, which means to say, if you breathe, there is a chemical reaction in the body. You eat to digest, there are multiple chemical reactions. While that is happening, there is a lot of enzymes involved, EAO, everything involved, right? While that is happening, on the side, while things are utilized, free radicals are released. Like pollutants of the food? Or uh, not really. It's just a 
it's just a radical less of an it's just an uh, molecule less of an ion so it's hyperactive okay and it can destruct things now generally body has its own free radical quenchers which we call antioxidants you can quench it and body goes on but when the free radical becomes excess that is when body can't handle and today we have supplements with free radicals which which does quite a lot of damage control as in supplements to counter free radical correct. damage correct okay like like the most famous infamous glutathion for example is one of the free radical damage Damn. controllers and that then leads to inflammation and inflammation is your body calling all its defense system to say come and fight so that is inflammation but when it is simply calling everyone to fight inflammation is counterproductive then right so that is what happens that is inflammation inflammation when it happens is good for a reason at a certain extent in a certain direction that is saving your body of anything that is aggressors internal or external but you keep irritating it the fellows keep coming then there is so much inflammation there which itself becomes counterproductive to you so that is inflammation okay originally we were talking about your review of my 20s that ha. whole timeline and ha. we'll go back to that ha. but uh i want to ask you something that i've thought about and correct me as a doctor hmm. okay in my eyes what i have figured about say that one stray pimple you get once in a while which everyone deals with okay uh, or if you're dealing with adult acne and your whole face is covered in acne uh any pimple is your body trying to tell you hey this could be something that's wrong hmm. it's like your body's compass to your mind it shows up on your face you're seeing your face every day it's your body saying something's going wrong on the inside and if you just accept that and understand that and then try reverse engineering it Correct. sorry sorry about bringing engineering, engineering. In but uh, if you try reverse engineering then hmm, what did i do in the last week did i smoke did i drink did i eat something that i don't usually eat in excess yeah that's what showed up on my face because this is literally what i did in my 20s that i had a little book i would just started to say make maintain a food diary or maintain a activity diary so you will food know diary. like I think the the thing that solved my acne in the long term was just dietary yeah, changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean the the Accutane solved it for that one phase, but it's, the, it's just a it's like a crocin. And I want to fever. Accutane later a lot. We'll do. I have friends who are taking Accutane perpetually and all that. Yeah. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Interesting. So mm. that's a whole other topic mm. because it's also one of the most effective ways to fully like make your acne sleep. I'll tell you how. We we we'll, we'll come we'll get there. there because it's a very it's it's one of my big pre-planned questions for this podcast and we have a long <laughs> way to go. But I think it's important to talk about this basics yeah. of yeah. Uh, acne thing. So we'll go back to the timeline. Chica. You were talking about how food I, we solved. Yeah, and we solved your uh, aggressors such as smoking, drinking, evo. We said no. It's it's the stress that is important. Whatever stresses you. Sure. If smoking is stressing you out, if drinking is stressing you out, sleep lack of sleep can also cause acne. anything that stresses you can throw out like you rightly said it's the compass skin hair and nail are literally a diagnostic tool for what's happening inside the body very very easy to find out just looking at this what's happening inside so therefore acne is one of those things like i like you rightly said okay go back to the timeline i forgot what we did and what you want me to now go i was uh, for me we finished what uh we were talking about for me like when i left meat so meat, i'll tell you what ha, happened food we saw When I specifically left red meat, there mm. was a massive drop in how much acne I had, and for a while, Good. my white meat didn't Matter. like affect it, mm. and I didn't leave non-veg overnight. I left it gradually. Mm. Uh, I went into pescatarian pescatarianism, which is only eating seafood. That also was a significant Change. improvement for yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm this is not me saying hey, turn vegetarian and all that. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. Huh. I dislike those people, huh. but uh, because I, I food is so personal, there's yeah. so much emotion attached yeah. to food. Um, I get everyone's moral angles and all that, but food is a very personal thing. You can't force your ideas onto someone else who's not ready to change. This is what worked for me, and again, I'm approaching it from the perspective of skincare. Mm. Uh, so the seafood thing, it actually was great for my skin. Sure, it's got lovely omegas three six, yeah. which are also antioxidants, like I said, yeah. which is also anti-inflammatory. So fish not only is a lean meat and does not give you things bad, but it gives you things good. so it helps you in multiple ways also from an aesthetics perspective mm. uh i was very concerned that if i'm leaving non veg where am i going to get my protein mm. and it when you've eaten so much non veg in your life your body takes time to um switch to a vegetarian diet for protein which is why if anyone's even thinking of leaving non veg i always say leave it gradually, gradually. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, because those cravings actually mean something. If you're craving chicken, eat, eat it. it a little bit uh, in that phase of leaving. Yeah. Um, my point is, uh, you're talking about seafood. Yeah, but I'll tell you in this whole journey, the one thing I figured out and out, uh, my body started reacting very badly to eating egg yolks. And I've eaten eggs yeah. all my life. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so now I didn't know whether this is because as they say that modern day eggs are not eggs yeah <laughs> that they fill the I mean yeah. they, they pump the chicken with yeah. uh, lots of hormones yeah in order to lay more eggs uh, likewise the milk likewise the milk yeah um, how long does a normal cow if you go to the village and ask them how long after the birth of a baby can it give milk it doesn't perpetually give milk right here your cow is perpetually giving you milk what what I find hurtful yeah. is that in my childhood I ate so many eggs I drank so much milk and nothing, nothing would happen happened. even as a teenager for a long time I had like egg egg yolks and milk and only in adulthood so it's one of two things it's either that the quality of milk and eggs has reduced in Indian cities or my body as it aged was just rejecting these two mm. food items uh, but this was again the significant jump mm. for me mm. uh, would you like to say anything about this my only two bits to this is it's not just that things are going bad from the outside like bad eggs and bad milk. It's also as a child, you're expending so much energy. So these things you know how to digest will happen and your body needs it. And then as you grow older, like I said, what you don't need will only turn against you. So it's just causing more inflammation. You don't need it. You're firstly not spending so much energy in the out, putting it out. So there's a whole, multiple factors usually okay. that involve. It's not as simple as... Yeah, bad egg. Okay, let me start now getting from the gaon egg and I will ah. start having five egg. It may still not work. Got it. As a doctor, would you say that as you age, your body accepts and rejects different foods? Yeah, and it needs less food. It needs less food. So if you go back to our scriptures, there is those various phases of life, right? In that various phases of life, that if I'm right, there's vana prastha in the end or something like that. They end up going also to the forest. Then they start eating less and less and less also because body needs less. Your your expansion of energy, expending energy is lesser. So you need less. So your own body changes over time. And sometimes you say, oh, this was fine for me. Like you said, after some time, my egg yolk didn't work for me. So as you keep changing your diet and your lifestyle, some fellow is working, like a carb is working with a protein to cut this, cut that and go ahead. An apple is not just a vitamin A, right? There are so many things that we know and we don't know in that. So one cuts the other and life goes on. But once you take away one, just this one may not work for you. That is when you would say, oh, this was fine before. Now why is it not working? That could be. You're simply your body can grow and say, now I don't like it anymore. So you can develop an allergy any point of your life. Hmm. Likewise, you can develop a rejection to food at any point, a particular food at any point in your life. You just, like you said, listen to your body. Close your eyes, listen to your body. That's all is what you need to do. You don't even need a doctor. Also considering the fact that there's so much pollution nowadays, mm. at least I can speak for Mumbai and Delhi, mm. that definitely plays a role yeah. in your Why skin's not? health. Mm, yes and no, it does. But honestly, Ranveer, how many of us are running in the pollution? You're sitting in an AC room, you're sitting in an AC car, you're going to an AC restaurant. So it's all, I wouldn't say AC means no pollution. There are still things here which are not absolutely clean. We're not air filtering it and purifying it. But... Dust and pollution and all this, I would still relate it more to the allergies, to the eczemas that are so much on the high rise now. Acne, acne, I would still relate it to stress and food and hormones and heritage. I wouldn't say personally pollution is such a big thing, a hand in playing towards. Okay. Hmm. Um, I'm feeling a little guilty right now because I'm... <laughs> I'm indirectly taking a free consultation from you <laughs> in some ways. So sorry. That's okay. We dumps are used to it. <laughs> really? I'm telling you, it's so difficult. You go to any party, anywhere. There are people, one, they ask about themselves. I can still understand that. You know, my sister-in-law had this. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> How do you feel? No, now I have learned the art of just smiling. Acha? Really? <laughs> uh huh. And that's it. You're not asking me for solution. I'm not giving you solution. Then the next step of kya karu is a little difficult to ask. No. Mm. So I don't know. Earlier I was like, oh, they're asking means I have to give a solution. Mm. So I just said, do all of that solution and then feel irritated also. Mm. Saying, you know, I never had a good time. All I did was talking this. 
how irritating how can they do this to me blah 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 all that now i have learned to say okay you are asking i'm happy thank you god <laughs> grateful that you are asking me and you're considering me as an expert but i'm not answering mm. <laughs> so it happens at parties ha <laughs> everywhere after this episode get used to it happening <laughs> even more uh but mm. okay we're going to come back to that timeline i have two three more factors again yeah. which i felt used to wreck my skin see the reason i'm expanding these thoughts so much is um it took me more than a decade to figure, figure out, out this mathematical formula and if my kid is going to deal with acne or if a younger brother younger sibling is dealing with acne i will tell them this same huh. stuff that yeah. listen try these these yeah. things quickly uh, because when i was that age i didn't know who to ask and all that um so the other thing that really affected me was um, artificial sweeteners yeah like i noticed this based on my food diary are it's not just artificial sweeteners i'm telling you you look at a prepacked food and it will be written fruit sugar and you think ah oh, this is fruit sugar this is very good what is that fructose coming from it is artificial only he's not going to squeeze a fruit and extract the thing and put it in there it is the most biggest lie there so yes any sugar for that matter any sugar so cut out sugars completely when i say cut out sugars most of my patients say ha ah, we cut out sugars but we have now started stevia no not happening why are we say- okay let's get back to why are we saying cut out sugar because it gives you an insulin it gives you a sugar spike when you get a sugar sp- when you eat for example a protein why do they say it's good because of course there's a lot of energy there is a sustained release of sugar right it's all sugar at the end correct you eat a sustained release carb like we mangalorians eat parboiled rice which has a envelope outside so these are sustained release carbohydrates so they give you the sugar you eat anything sweet it could even be a fruit like a chikku or a you know custard apple sita phal what we call it it could be even that minute it tastes sweet on your tongue means your body is getting sugar it keeps getting sugar each time it gets sugar a little insulin is released to digest that and store that right you keep giving it sugar insulin keeps getting at some time insulin doesn't work so you get an insulin resistance uh basically when you eat carbohydrates especially the building block of a carbohydrate is sugar is glucose mm. Mm. the way your body digests that and please chip in doctor mm. you, the way your body digests that is it sees oh okay there's sugar in my stomach i need to spike this hormone called insulin mm. in order to digest that this fellow yeah glucose mm. uh the thing is if you're eating too much sweet food over time your insulin spikes so much that your body develops a condition called insulin resistance it doesn't work then but I, insulin is still sitting there floating free floating which is a very harmful thing uh, so it's the sugar is also harming the insulin which fellow is not working now but it is sitting there that is also not a good thing oh okay it just yes. excess of insulin in your blood stream is will, also not good thing it will cause inflammation yes it will cause inflammation it will cause other hormone disruptions that like an okay. lh surge like then you are more getting into more depth so all this is going to happen that can lead to pcos in a woman luteinizing hormone oh my god are you an engineer <laughs> <laughs> right it's yeah. lh yeah. if you yeah. want go into the details people yeah. watch podcast for this oh lovely so everybody wonders right Explain why it. pcos happens now where does it start from how does it happen again PCOS I'm bringing in because acne happens with PCOS that's one thing that people recognize right along with skin pigmentation on the neck and xyz so you let's there are stress there are other things that cause it your excessive weight stress all of this but in all this one common factor also is the the insulin surge resistant insulin there is an lh surge so your lh is then more than the fsh that ratio tilts once that tilts there is a lot of other things that happens in the end what happens is your male hormone also goes up your dhas can go up your testosterone can go up your dht can go up your sometimes your inflammatory female hormone which is prolactin can go up that causes this red angry ac- angry acne on people's faces with a little bit of breast tenderness then i know there is a prolactin race that should be then brought down so this a whole gamut of hormones which actually come together or work individually to cause a hormonal ha- acne in a woman even in men it's not just testosterone like you said prolactin excess can cause um uh, acne lh excess can also happen lh surge in a man can also cause to- cause acne so all of this can happen 
Okay. Oh. Damn. Abo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about this whole testosterone rise in males Haan. causing acne. Okay. Uh, I. Okay, you know what? Let's talk about that after this particular question. Mm. Is male acne and female acne different? Acne in a male and acne in a female is different because in general, I'm generalizing. In, again, a female can have exactly the same gland size as a male can have. But I'm saying in general, males have more sebaceous gland, which is the oil gland in a given surface area on the cheek or on wherever than I have as a female. First difference. Second difference, your gland itself can be bigger than my gland. Two, glands are usually influenced by hormones. Testosterone is one of the main hormones that influences the gland. So testosterone in you and testosterone in me will influence it similarly. Influence means it will cause it to secrete more oil. More, the gland can become bigger, more secretion can happen. It can have more pockets there. It's not just one clean gland like that. It is like a bunch of grapes. So it can secrete more. It can secrete more. All that can happen. Gland size only can become. When the gland size becomes bigger, your pore size becomes bigger because the opening is bigger. Then it, your skin becomes oily. So an oily skin is usually having a bigger pore and therefore more prone to acne because not because of the pore itself getting clogged or whatever, whatever. Beneath the bigger pore is a bigger gland which can have more content, co content of sebaceous secretion in it, which is that white uh, stearic acid, the, the fatty acid, stearic acid content that is there, which comes out. If it didn't come out and got plugged from the top, and then it sits there, it gets inflamed, it gets infected and become an acne. That is your pimple, correct? So that is usually triggered, that excessive oil is the first thing that can happen. And that is triggered by testosterone. So testosterone in you is more than me. My testosterone only may become excess that it can make acne on my face is when I may have a PCOS. Mm. Or I have a, not just the ovarian, adrenal excess of uh, testosterone can happen. Male hormone can happen. So in this a woman? Is, in a woman. How does an adrenal excess happen? Again, stress, cortisol release, a whole hormonal pathway which leads to more adrenal excess of hormone that can happen. So we make some, we do some blood tests to figure out where the excess is and treat accordingly. Sometimes we as derms treat ourselves. Sometimes we are in conjunction with an OBG, which is a gynecologist and we treat. Sometimes we are in conjunction with an endocrinologist and we treat. So this is how it's a multi-speciality thing it becomes. Therefore, when you get an acne, just go, don't go to your auntie or your medical store, get a tube and just apply it. It's, it's not as simple. <laughs> Put some multani material. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, again, too many tangential questions. If people are dealing with a lot of pimples or any skin condition, mm. if they take a blood test, mm. would that blood test actually indicate mm. the core problems? Can, but you don't randomly do a blood test. What? One blood test are expensive, number one. So okay. every teenager, acne teenager is not going to just simply say, that's our blood test and they'll say, what is this? That itself will cost you more than tens of thousands. So you don't end up doing it. How much? I think... I genuinely don't know because I don't have a tie-up with any lab. So I don't know. I have had patients come and say, Doc, this costed me more than 10, 20,000. So something like that. If I give you a whole hormone panel, it can cost you something like that. My point is, unless I clinically examine you, like I said, for example, prolactin excess, if you have breast tenderness, as a man, if you have gynecomastia and breast tenderness, I may think, oh, maybe prolactin. I'll say, okay, prolactin. Kar do. Or if I think, no, no, her periods are disrupted or I see hair fall or I see hair growing on the face, along with acne, then I'll say, oh, there's, there's an excessive androgen excess, male hormone excess. Then I will check two, three androgens that I want to check. Then to see if it is adrenal or it is ovarian, I will check a few things. So then I need a blood test. So I will only order or ask for a blood test if clinically I have first taken history, examined you, had some signs to indicate to me this is a hormonal driven acne, number one. Two, then which hormone driven also, I already know when I have done it. Most of the times, just for the thrill of it, to show off, I tell my patients, we'll do all of these tests, but I'm telling you, these three will be disrupted, but these two, I just want to make sure. They say, oh my God, you're exactly right. <laughs> I'm very thrilled. <laughs> so, the, so we already know in a clinical examination, what is wrong. Only then will I ask for a blood test. Everybody doesn't have to do a blood test. Like for example, insulin resistance. I get to know if you have a little darkness on the neck. 
the thick dark skin on the neck what we call a canthosis darkness around this part a min, many men have that so if i look at it and if you are slightly overweight then i know okay there is a canthosis happening let us check insulin resistance which means i will do a fasting insulin i will also do something called as hba1c to see your cumulative sugar and how you are you are assimilating it i will get an idea then it could be this then i will give you certain medications to see how i can lower thing i'll give you a dietary adjustment i will do all of this so that is the way i give you blood investigations not like a random list and say sab kara ke likhe aao okay um i've noticed that if one visits a dermatologist and say if you have pimples i've gone myself i've taken a cousin of mine also the dermatologist will look at the person's pimple mm. with a magnifying glass sometimes mm. uh and from the nature of the pimple they'll be able to kind of tell what's happening mm. like cystic acne versus mm. redness etc mm. what's happening in your head as a dermatologist when you're doing so that? when i'm honestly holding now i'm going to give you one little secret inside ah holding this and all is simply simply we do <laughs> because i'll tell you as a doctor with 20 years of experience i look at you and i know what's happening finish one minute i know what's happening right i can dish out and say but you are not happy are doctor never gave me time doctor didn't look at me properly so we simply do little looking at times which is not necessary most of the acne times it's really not necessary because you look and you know the morphology or the type of acne like you said is it all looking similar type of little little white uh, pustules sometimes it may be and i'm going to throw another angle to your talk it may not even be the regular thing that you're thinking it may be steroid abuse acne which means to say you've used steroid over a long period of time then you get something called as almost sterile acne it's not infected but it is it it looks like acne sometimes what what, what is that that is that looks like acne it's very difficult to treat but because you use it's not acne but you've been using steroid for a long time and that happens and because this acne happens you're continuing to use steroid because somebody told you use steroid and that's a nightmare to treat so that could be something else so that i can see by naked eye i don't need a lens or a mirror to see that you're talking about anabolic steroids right no 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 oh, application steroid. which is so oh. easy in our country over the counter are kuch ho gaya the chemist will say ye laga lo oh metnovet okay. laga lo tinovet laga lo you know desoven laga lo elecon laga lo all these are steroids which you shouldn't be touching you're saying steroid based ointments, ointments yes which are used to treat acne in the first place first place should not be used used in the wrong way oh, that benzoyl peroxide benzoyl peroxide is not a steroid okay benzoyl peroxide is is a a substance or a chemical which actually gives you bacteriostatic it is which means it stops the bacteria from growing it reduces the oil it's a wonderful thing for me that is that is one of the magic things every acne patient goes with the benzoyl peroxide but again it can be very very irritant to the skin so it's important to make sure your skin is firstly healthy can take benzoyl peroxide barrier is protected and healed then i give benzoyl peroxide we start with a short contact therapy we do like a 1 hour or a 2 hour to see how the skin is taking it otherwise firstly you have acne then you have a red skin dry skin how many of acne patients i'm really wanting to know acne is one thing you are also worried about what those ointments did to your face it became red it became irritated it became painful it is tender you can't apply anything everything is burning you don't want that to add on to your acne right so therefore you titrate it in such a way okay i did a separate angle sorry no that's fine that's how podcasts are <laughs> uh, we can we can go back you're yeah. talking about steroid based acne so please don't jump and use steroids for your acne be very careful number one long term use of steroids can cause acne which is not necessarily the acne that we are talking about acne form eruptions is what happens there so it looks like acne so everything that looks that's why you're saying a doctor looks at your skin more deeply sometimes it may not even be acne sometimes it could be folliculitis on the neck or on the beard area when men come with saying oh i have acne it could be folliculitis where the hair follicle is infected so then we do treat similarly but a little differently there so that's not necessarily hormone induced then acne itself like you said if it is red if it is angry we know it's very inflamed acne if there's a lot of pus there if it is also painful it could be inflammatory and infected first it could just be a blackhead it could just be a whitehead those are first grades of acne initial stages of acne then you can have all of them at one point then you can only graduate and become very painful hard pimples and nodules they become if they become really hard so it could be that in which case sometimes you may have to cut open and remove the whole capsule sometimes we may inject a little steroid into it to suppress the inflammation 
all this is done judiciously but go to the right doctor don't treat acne like are ye to acne hai no i think until this point of the podcast we've only addressed that root cause problem i correct me if i'm wrong yeah but all these actors models content creators influencers who come to you hmm. uh, a lot of them come for uh cleaning up their skin in the short term as well that's my happens. assumption happens happens because tomorrow they have a shoot then there's an acne today what happens doc fix me now then we'll figure out it's like that that happens and what's the the medical treatment for that so if you do have one acne sitting there which is irritating we all know makeup can cover imperfections in terms of color surface imperfections are very difficult to cover so i understand it's their it's their emergency so we end up giving in a tiny bit of steroid into we call it intra lesional steroid but 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 please go to our qualified dermatologist please don't do it excessively that can cause a side effect of causing like a cut down your face if it is done wrongly so go to an expert make sure the right amount right quantity right little bit is put in there to immediately suppress the inflammation you can cover them with an antibiotic if you think 2 3 are there and if it looks inflamed or infected it depends i may simply give also like a anti inflammatory an enzoflam to pop so the inflammation the redness the itching goes down sometimes acne is with with an inflammatory background so there is a itching in your acne if that is there then there's also an inflammatory background there so i give simply anti inflammatory with the acne therapy gone are the days that antibiotic was given for long i for one don't believe in giving too much of isotretinoin or tretinoin whatever you call it i for one don't believe it we'll get there when you ask me those questions so like i said we are dwelling deep and asking is it food is it pollution is it hormone it could also simply be an inflammatory acne an allergic acne you got to something that you just applied a cream and you can break out like for example i'm i'm a derm right so i keep getting hajar products to test so yesterday i saw some bottle which look very if you touch me you will see there's an acne now and and for me i've never had an acne in my life you have amazing skin thank like. you that, uh, it's genes I, i i want to say oh, it's all me but jeep uh, <laughs> <laughs> manglorian genes as well and very very disciplined lifestyle we were just talking before and you said what helped me is discipline i want to say I am born like a military legend. Till date, I have an alarm in my head. I get up at the same time. I sleep around the same time. I eat around the same time. I eat the same thing. It's regimental lifestyle, which is lead to good skin. Anyway, so my point is, I have an acne because day before yesterday, somebody got me some beautiful serum and said, "Doc, we want you to test it." Last morning, I was looking. I had put it on, left it for some two three hours. Later in the clinic in the evening, I could already feel something happening. By night, I knew there was an acne. Mm. So it could just be that. so causes of acne like you rightly said can't be covered in a 2 second instagram video when people tell me talk about acne people's attention is short please do it within one minute like i can't but how about a two hour podcast uh, i think this is bleeding there <laughs> <laughs> no but can it yeah of course i mean it's interesting for a person who's interested and who's affected i don't know how much interesting it will be in such depth for a person who's not affected um pimple related videos if the content is strong hmm. are some of our short sure short hits wow that's how much the country is suffering yeah yeah you know singapore had had declared acne as a pandemic at one time really they had so much acne and it had become all resistant because everybody gave antibiotics to this is this was some years ago and it had become resistant so that is when people started shifting from giving earlier they used to give antibiotic for 6 6 months 3 3 months in acne now i for one give you for maybe 10 days worst case scenario i also give pulse therapy wherein i give you a like a 10 or a 15 day then i give you on a just weekends for couple of times till i get the control of that infection that will severe cases otherwise 7 to 10 days is all that i give initially to just get rid of that infection on your face so anyway okay go on The one thing I know about the medical community is that you guys are lifelong students because the body is yet to be understood completely. Also, that's why it's called a practice, right? Like medical practice. Yeah. So we are practicing. We are practicing. We are learning. We are understanding. Science is evolving. Our und body may not be evolving as much as our understanding of it is changing. We are learning more every day. Even today, we do cadaver. Uh, like I don't know whether you know, my expertise is. in facial reshaping and keeping someone youthful and getting their best attractive face forward and 
I'm also known for a very natural result where nobody can say what I've done. Even today, I go and do Kedava Labs where we open up, which should have finished in my first year MBBS. And anatomy it is, right? How much we are not changing from a, we finished changing from a monkey to here. We are not now evolving and changing. We are still there. But we still go and continuously do cadaver dissections. And each time you do, there's something new coming. Even now there are papers published in anatomy to say, oh, there's an aberration in this artery. Oh, we found a new thing here. Oh, we found a new ligament there. Continuously we are still finding. Mm. So science, science is evolving is one thing. Basis on our understanding evolving. We are still discovering. We are still finding out. We are still knowing what bodies. Yeah. And as you learn about the body more, yeah. you also learn about the treatments exactly. more. Then you and evolve the science accordingly. Treatments also change. Correct. Correct. I'm from a family of doctors, which is why maybe I may have the liberty of saying this. Yeah. But I have, this is an outside perspective, mm. okay? Just observation. Mm. I've always seen these two kinds of doctors. Mm. The ones that evolve with the times and the ones that don't. Yeah. Have I said something too harsh? No. This is Very how the medical community... 100%. And it's not like the older ones don't know. Even amongst the older doctors who are above age 60, there's the same category. Yes. I've seen an 80-year-old doctor asking questions. It's and nothing to do with to... age, like you rightly said. We've got some rock stars at 80 who are still evolving, who are still on stage, teaching us a new concept, doing the next new thing. You're like, wow, inspirational. Um, We had... Dr. Pal Manikam, who actually runs a very nice Instagram page. He's a gut doctor. Oh, wow. And gastroenterologist. Right? Okay. That's what, yeah. That's what yeah. the... Gastroenterologist. Uh, hmm. Very nice conversation. Really? Yeah. Uh, he spoke about how our microbiome is so diverse yeah. and all that. Yeah. Uh, and I'd just like to know what you think of mm. the, what I'm going to say mm. now. Um, he... It was a very long... It was like how we're talking in detail about mm. skin. He mm. spoke about the gut in detail. Mm. Fantastic Amazing. conversation. Mm. One of the takeaways for me was that he's very, very hesitant about antibiotics, antibiotic use now. Yeah. He's like, even he said that five years ago, it was different. But yeah. over the course of his career, he's just seen that even a basic level antibiotic, nothing too strong, but even a basic one is like an atom bomb for your gut. True. In terms of it'll just wipe away your natural uh, gut Flora. bacteria, yeah. which is actually needed for living a life with even good mental health. That yes. was the core of... Oh, yes. Like your gut bacteria is yes, related yes. to your mental health also. Yes. So imagine how much it's related to your physical health. Yeah. Um, so I want to know what you think of antibiotics because I also remember when I was dealing with my acne, one of the most effective treatments for me was, I don't remember which antibiotic. Antibiotic. But some yeah. doctor had put me on an antibiotic and my acne cleared up like yeah. in a week. Mm. And my skin was glowing also. Mm. So two questions. One, how did that happen from a skin perspective? Like, how did the antibiotic work so much on my skin? Mm. And two, do you or do you not recommend antibiotics nowadays? I do. I still do. I do in a way where, like I said, initially, if a patient has come to you, acne for many people can just be, oh, it's an aesthetic thing. Trust me, I've had youngsters or even adults for that matter coming to me crying, saying it is so painful. Even if it touches the pillow, I screech with pain. It is so painful. I remove my clothes, it touches, it hurts. So it is very painful. So I need to relieve you of that pain instantly. The pain is because there's so much infection and inflammation there, which has to subside. In your gut? For, no, on the face. The so I have to give you an antibiotic. Okay. Now, When I give you an antibiotic, it is going to affect the gut. So to kind of mitigate that, I'm also giving you a good gut bacteria with it. So I, your question is, do you still treat antibiotics? Acne with antibiotic? Yes, I do. But that is not my mainstay. So I only treat that infection part for the first few days with an antibiotic. Curb it down. While I do that, I'm giving you the good bacteria. I am looking over your diet to make sure you're getting all of that soothing and healing the gut lining. Once I do that, then I switch off from antibiotics because I'm not the doctor who likes a long-term antibiotic. I would rather do things from the top. So when my young teenagers come with their mamas, and I say, oh, let's do a peel on her and let's just do a little clean up. They're like, oh, she's so small. Do you want to do a peel? I'm like, I'd rather do a controlled peeling from the top in that surface that I want to than putting her through many, many medicines inside for it to slowly come and reach the skin to actually work. Then they see sense in it. And then in the end, they're obviously thankful and say, oh, you know, this cleared up and you didn't give her any medicines. We're so happy. Blah, blah, blah. So my whole point is, yes, you disrupt the gut for a little while. That body is so beautiful. It'll recover. 
unless you are badgering it for a long time where body forgets that gut, some flora, you wiped it out, then it is difficult. But otherwise, you're killing a few. few stra- and that strain of few still remaining, it'll recover. Hmm. A small term antibiotic, in my opinion, you don't need to get so hyper about because it is important for you to actually take care of yourself at that moment. For example, you have a lung infection, a face infection, skin. You need that at that moment. Then yes, you. the minute you don't need, you should get off. Those long antibiotics that we used to do before, that is what killed the gut flora for good. Here you are depleting it a little. It will come back again. You're depleting it. It will come back again. Okay. Uh I'm just trying to draw the parallels between the Dr. Manikam conversation sure, and this. Sure. Uh, he spoke about how important it is to actually uh, take care of your gut bacteria. Gut bacteria. And the, the CTA, like the call to action there is eat a lot of varied foods, etc. That's, that's the basic CTA. Because our bodies are still in Stone Age zone. Hmm. Like that's how our biology is built. And when we were hunter-gatherers, we would end up eating a lot of different uh, kinds of foods, uh, etc. My non-medical conjecture, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mm. is that I've noticed that, again, coming back to the tier two angle, if I spend a week in Goa, uh, my skin starts glowing. And it's not just Goa. Mm. This is any any place outside of Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai. It's your stress, sir. When you're here, you're doing 20 things. Like you said, when we walked in, I have 10 other businesses. So you're doing that and you're doing this. And I can see how much preparation you've already done before this podcast to ask me the relevant questions and to know it. If you didn't know well enough, you won't ask me these questions. And when I answered, you didn't know what to do next. So I see you put in a lot of work. It's stress. Gut where it comes in terms of maintaining the bacteria, the food is, how I understand as a doctor is, Your body has understood, like I said in the beginning of our conversation, how to digest your food. Because your body innately from your mother's canal, from your whatever body that you have had, has had a certain flora. And it is maintaining that flora and nurturing it. And depending on what you have eaten as you grow, there is a set of flora. There is is a set of combination in your stomach, which is yours. That is why it knows to digest its food. That is why it's happier when it eats certain food because you have your set. So that is it. I don't think, you know, I don't believe in simply every day popping a mycobacterial, whatever, combination. The gut bacteria, they say, oh, probiotic, we'll have prebiotic, we'll we'll have this one every day. I don't believe in doing that because you don't need to put that X million that he has put inside that may not be my gut bacteria. He can't be putting everything. So allow it to heal. Have your desi food. Have your comfort food. For me, I remember my a uh, mom when we were young and if you had a bad tummy if you went out and ate something and got a bad tummy they say dahi ha, two days ha, your mom said dahi chawal my mom said dahi chawal with a little rasam also in it if you want or they ended up saying we eat something called ganji the parboiled rice you end up boiling it and you actually remove away the water so you've drained off the excess starch now it's more easy to digest so excessively boil we boil it excessively so it literally each grain opens up that ganji is so rich. And today, this the world is talking about that. Congee, they call it. Ah, oh, crispy congee rice. Ah, that is it. Congee is nothing but our ganji, which was parboiled rice, which was overly boiled, starch removed, sometimes kept overnight and fermented. Comes to a stage of fermentation in the morning. You can even add uh, benjana, they call it. Ganji benjana is ganji and uh, curd. So you put that in the morning, have it. There is no better probiotic than that. Mm. Healed our gut, soothed our gut and we are very happy. So like that, your each each region will have... The other day I went to one of my friend's house, Mona, she's a bong. She had similar, I was like, wow. So they had mutton with this overnight fermented rice with uh, very, very diluted curd in it. I was like, wow, we do it. She said, we also do it. They had some name which I've forgotten. So I'm sure every region has their own desi probiotic so that's 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 good to heal your gut and yes gut is very important not just for acne again i'm bringing back also for your eczema also for your other things gut is very important there is a gut skin access very important why do you bring up eczema so like what is eczema eczema is when you this is eczema like you can't see much because it's not exacerbated right now you know you see cuts in some people's skin some people have lip that they keep licking licking all the time 
and they're licking because they are thinking, oh, lip is dry, but there is a slight lip eczema there. Like dry skin. Very dry skin, which almost leads to cut and pain for some people. Extreme eczema can cause pain. Now I have seen a lot of patients with eczema because pollution, stress, all that actually induces and exacerbates eczema, eczematic skin. So that can run in the family. So that's eczema. So I keep bringing it up because also allergies are related to it. So a lot of allergies come in. So highest thing, like you said initially, acne is the highest in, in derm practice for teenagers. I would say eczema, allergy, acne, and pigmentation. These are the four things which I see max. Pigmentation. Mm. What is pigmentation? Darkness of your skin. For anything. Maybe no. post acne, you end up getting those black spots, gray spots, red spots. Mm. They can be pigmentation. Or like I said, in insulin resistance, you can get end up having a dark skin all over here or on your neck. That is a form of pigmentation. Could okay. be anything. Okay. Mm. Uh, what is your body trying to tell you through the eczema? That there's a lot of inflammation. I'm angry. I'm unhappy. Treat me. Calm me. Soothe me. Even my skin also, like the gut has a microbiome. Skin has a microbiome. You could get acne when the skin microbiome is disrupted and therefore your P acne stands up. Or your um, skin microbiome disrupts so you may end up getting eczema. Eczema in turn causes cuts and disruption in the barrier and that can also lead to skin microbiome difference. Simply you put your AHA, BHA can cause disruption of skin microbiome. How do you actually damage your skin microbiome? Like I said, simply using excessive skin so-called scrub, I hate that word, exfoliation. Uh, so-called scrubbing your skin in excess. I see a lot of youngsters, oh, we love this scrub, we love that scrub. I don't want to name a brand. There is one very, very popular brand. Horrible thing that is. Such thick granules, so rough on the face. I'm like, what are you scrubbing away? You need to be treating your skin like a petal. You can't be scrubbing it away. Do you not believe in exfoliation? I do believe in exfoliation, but I don't believe in scrubbing. How, what's the difference? Scrubbing is harsh. It is, it is, uh, it's rough. You're just taking thicker granules and just doing that to see whether something is coming out. Nothing actually comes out. It's not so easy to rip your skin off. That is scrubbing. Why? It's like a sandpaper on your skin is scrubbing. Exfoliation is a gentle loosening of the top dead layer of the skin, which is still sticking there and you actually don't need it. Body has already kind of thrown it out. Layers of skin come up as they mature, right? They keep coming up from the basal layer. La -dat, la -dat, la -dat. And then they sit on the top, which is a dead layer of keratinocytes, which is your, like a protein dead cell. And it is sitting on top, which also has some melanin, which is your pigment cell, which gets clumped and sits with it. So, it's, so therefore, when you exfoliate, you feel a little fairer because clumped melanin and the dead keratin is kind of gone. Now that can be done either physically or chemically. When you do it physically in a harsher layman term, it's called scrub, which is not a nice thing to do. What you could do is still use your so-called scrub, but look at the granule size. You have these beautiful rice powder from one particular brand. I love it. You have these very nice sugar from another brand, which is very beautiful. So these are nice things where you should know when you're rubbing, it's not feeling rough on your skin. It's kind of melting on your skin. Mm. The granules are more round, smooth, small. You usually use it along with the face wash so that there is water and it easily moves on your skin. Use it with the face wash. So that is gently exfoliating. In the olden days, we used to do microdermabrasion in the clinics, which I hate right now. I don't know whether still some people are using it. That's something that you don't do. But a hydrofacial is something where you gently exfoliate it like that. Then there is chemical exfoliation, which is your AHAs, BHAs, whatever you call lactic acid, salicylic acid, all those acids that you get over the bottle now. Everybody has serum 10%, 20%, 12%. Those are all chemical exfoliants. And in your doctor's office, we do peels, which is a chemical exfoliant of different acids, different grades, different combinations. Now, they exfoliate. So in bringing back to the perspective of acne, if you do have clogged pores, if you do have continuous blackheads and whiteheads, then a good exfoliation, gentle exfoliation under your doctor's guidance may benefit you quite a lot. Does makeup harm skin. No, but I love makeup and I think everybody should love makeup. I, I mean, I don't apply makeup, but I would love, if I knew well, I would. What harms the skin or leads to so-called, let's say, exacerbation of your acne is the applicator. Most people don't clean their sponges well. 
and then they say oh i cleaned it means what i've just washed it with a little soap under the thing the bacteria will be sitting inside the things of the sponge sitting that wet sponge tomorrow morning you're using it again it is bad so disposable sponges a quick tip uh brushes absolutely no if you're a if you're a artist and you have need makeup on i always tell my artist please go 300 rupees you get a whole dabba of disposable triangle sponges so just keep chucking it out don't reuse the sponge and don't use a brush at all you can use your brush for your eyeliner your lip and whatever defined makeup that you have to do blending a makeup on your face please don't use a brush because the bristles can harm your skin quite a lot even if it's soft even if it is soft and bristles can just transfer the infection also pretty much you know well if you have a pimple it'll move to yeah, other part yeah so okay and it'll irritate also however soft it is it'll still irritate and you don't want anything even mildly irritating and therefore inflammation coming there so you're you're wait you're taking away inflammation why are you bringing in and leading inflammation to that point so it is the applicator and not the makeup of course i'm assuming everybody is using great makeup good makeup they understand you need to preserve your makeup well you need to wash tubes has to be cleaned you don't want things flowing out of the you know dabba you need to clean it all well close it really well keep it really clean not in a place where there is a lot of dust your cakes cake makeups should not be kept open those sponges which come with it has to be just thrown so that it is clean and you use a disposable sponge you make sure every now and then you see the expiry date and throw it away however favorite a makeup is we all travel and buy this one that one that one and oh you love it so you don't throw it i'm not getting it here no throw it so these are a few things general caution if you take use a good good brand it's not something very heavy so that it's all clogging your face don't leave makeup on your face for a long time wash it off if you do all of this really well then makeup is enjoy okay so we covered acne and i think honestly there's so much content about acne that people know the basics of it yeah. this is why i wanted to bring on a dermatologist to talk about it from your own lens but i'd also love for you to talk about skin care a little bit from your own lens other than the basics of wash your face twice a day if you worked out and you uh, you're sweating a lot then wash your face um there's a lot of new stuff that's come into the world of skin care recently for example retinol for example um I don't know some acid. What's the everything is an acid. Lyru... Retinol is also retinoic acid. Lyrulonic, hyaluronic, hyaluronic. <laughs> <laughs> I meant mean hyaluronic. Uh, but I, I hear these two yeah, yeah. words yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, my initial plan with you was to cover dermatology as a whole. Oh. And now realize wide. that we need a second yeah. episode to cover yeah. um, things like glutathione and yeah. all those. Yeah. Um, but from a very 2023 skin care perspective and i'm not asking you for the basics here because even teenagers nowadays know that you're supposed to wash your face and yeah, yeah, all yeah, that yeah. yeah um we just spoke about exfoliation and you know you broke it down maybe the last question related to exfoliation is mm. is it correct to say that mm. you exfoliate you should yeah. exfoliate once yeah. a week mm, yeah you can you okay. can okay yeah. now give us that advanced breakdown of all this retinol vagera I'll tell you the problem in that is it is so vast. So I would say in general for the actives I understand during covid there were so many companies which floated a lot of indian companies also floated and international companies floated with actives and with advanced skin treatment and with ye lagao wo lagao all those things and 10 steps and one step and all that came out right korean skin care everything came out. So everybody started self buying things. So I must tell or warn that skincare is not like fashion. It's not that you buy something off the net, you wear it, oh, this is not looking nice. Okay, let me chuck it. When you apply it, like I said in this episode earlier, that I used a cream and it gave me an acne. One use of something can harm if it's not the right thing for you. So ingredients you need to leave it to a doctor. I'm on the on the scientific panel for a lot of corporates. like unilevers and pngs and stuff like that i work on a scientific basis with them so they were giving me the market intelligence which said that the highest searched ingredients today is like you said hyaluronic acid vitamin c and retinol so three are the highest searched things and imagine everybody is using vitamin c but vitamin c can be very harmful if your skin is dry if your skin is chappy or if it is like i keep saying eczema if i bring it like an eczematic skin or a cirrhotic excessively dry skin a sensitive skin a a sunburnt skin 
a skin which is ready to go for holiday, which means there is an impeding sunburn. Any of those situations of vitamin C can be detrimental to your Why? skin. One, it is an acid. It will sensitize your skin. It will burn your skin. It will be more sensitive to you. So as much as you think, oh, it's an antioxidant, it will protect me, it will do this, it will make me light, lighter, brighter, fairer, whatever you want to. Not for everyone. Not for every skin type. Not for every situation. Fair to say it's like a junior peel? Yeah, fair to say that. Okay. Fair to say that. So likewise, I'm saying something as common and as harmless as you're thinking vitamin C can do so much. And hyaluronic acid that you say has become everyone's god. Everybody's saying hyaluronic acid. I also put, I also put, I also put. Oh, it's hydrant, it's plumpy skin. Hyaluronic acid is just, let's say, how can I put it? It's a concentrated water. Tightly bound concentrated water. Loosely, that is what a hyaluronic acid can be like. So it will give you a lot of hydration to the skin. A hydrated but, look? Hydrated look, hydration. But it is an acid at the end of the day, right? So if you still put that on a very dry skin, it won't hydrate you. It will irritate you further. So that has to be also put on a skin where the barrier is intact. And just water is not enough. Skin needs to repair or protect or take care of itself. Three important things. Water, oil and protein. Which you call as peptides. Correct? So water, oil and protein. So you can't put one or the other. You can't put one and expect magic. There has to be a combination of certain thing. And it is not easy to say, let's talk about ingredients and let's tell one thing. There is no one ingredient which will match everyone. So all I'm trying to tell you is, if you want me to now give you more skincare than wash your face twice a day, protect, nourish, cleanse. Let's say start with this three as your mantra. Okay? Cleanse, of course, you know what to do. Now, cleanse can be very, very complicated, actually. I just did one long video on cleanse for my own audience. Because you think just buy a face wash and wash it. No. Or you think there's a three-step rate. No. Firstly, choosing the cleanser, correct cleanser can make or break your skin. So if you are a dry skin person and if you end up using a brightening face wash, for example, which may have acids in it, can harm your skin, make it further dry, irritated. Eventually that irritation leads to pigmentation. So you're trying to do brightening and lightening, you'll end up getting pigmentation. So therefore, choosing a face wash is very important. And acne prone skin sometimes, they end up going and looking at salicylic acid 2% or something, something acid that many percent. I know you have acne, I know you have oily skin, but you don't want to be driving it to extreme dryness. Body works on a feedback mechanism. Then your oil gland will say, there's no oil and it will produce even more. Yeah. So face wash becomes very, very important. So cleanse is your first step. It's not just about washing face twice a day. Use a correct cleanser. If you are someone who's out in the pollution dust a lot, you may need a pre-cleanse, which is oil-soluble dust has to be also removed. So you may need something like an oil to remove it off. If there's a lot of makeup, you may need micellar water to remove it off. Or post the wash itself, you may want to wash your face first of the dust and grime. And like you said, once in a week, use a little exfoliator to remove the top dead skin. So this all comes under cleansing. How do you remove your makeup correctly? You remove the pigment makeup first. Don't rub everything like this with an oil. Remove the pigment makeup, then use a separate cotton to remove the rest of it. So methods of cleansing, what you use for cleansing, what are the steps of cleansing, what skin type can be a discussion on its own. So yes, first thing is cleansing. Second thing, simply protect your skin. It could be from free radical damage, from pollution, from sun, from wind, from anything. Do you think sunscreen should be used by yeah, everyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these days, formulations of sunscreen is amazing. It just doesn't protect you from the UV rays. Protects you from the visible light, protects you from infrared rays, which can be inflammatory, make your skin red and irritated. So it really works well. So sunscreen is a must in everybody's regime in the time when the sun is up in the sky. What if you don't use sunscreen? What if you don't use a sunscreen? Nothing will happen. Uh, you may be more prone to pigmentation. You may be more prone to a slightly faster deterioration of your elastin and your collagen. Your aging will be faster. A little faster. You may get a little dehydrated, a little inflamed, more than the person who is nicely using a sunscreen regularly. A little inflamed means if you have little acne on your face, it'll grow in size. It something. could become little more red and more aggressive. Okay. Um, simply your skin might become red and irritated because infrared will heat up the skin. So that can end up making it red and irritated. So those things eventually leading to pigmentation, acne, whatever, whatever, any aggression. 
So yeah, protection means protecting from all of this, which could be moisturizer is itself a protection, right? Against the dust and the particles. So that's protection. Uh, then nourishing. Nourishing is, if your skin is dry, a good moisturizer is nourishing. If your skin is uh, very dehydrated, something very nice and, you know, like a little mist on the skin could be nourishing. So nourish your skin to what it requires to quench it, to calm it. Fourth step, which is optional, is correction and enhancement. That is where you can bring in your this serum, that serum, that tube, this acid, that all that can come there. Nourishment can also come from some good ingredients. Like food? No, I'm still talking of from the top. Oh, okay. You're talking only skincare okay, regime okay. from the top. Like so I said three step, right? So cleansing, protection and nourishment. Okay. So nourishing the skin can come from any of these good ingredients like a licorice, very nourishing to the skin. Calendula, calming and nourishing to the skin. Aloe vera? Um, I'm not a great fan of aloe vera to yeah. be honest. I was talking to a botanist long time back when aloe vera was Right then, everybody started growing one aloe vera in the kitchen pot. That is when I was like, how is this even possible? And me and my daughter were allergic to aloe vera, even from the plant. So I was like, oh, how did this happen? I'm not a botanist, so I don't understand that that well. So in some conference, I met a botanist and I was talking. So he was telling me, I may be wrong with the numbers that I'm, I'm telling you now. He said there's some 400 species of aloe vera or 700, something he said, out of which only four have medicinal value for skin. And he says, once you extract it, within four minutes, those values die. So what are we doing? I don't know. So like that. So everything natural may not be necessarily good. Yes. So okay. that is the long and short of skincare okay. regime. Okay. I think nowadays the chatter about skincare regimes is mainly about the sunscreen angle, which I asked you because mm. I see a lot of Indians on the fence about it mm. for multiple reasons. Mm. There are a lot of old school thinkers who think that I mean, this is what Ayurveda says that the sun is very good for your skin. It is good. It is good. It's yeah. Still, I'm also saying, even Western medicine will tell you yeah. the sun is good for the skin. Yeah. You need the vitamin D that it gets. You need, it stimulates happy hormones. Yeah. So, sun is very good in multiple levels for you. But that is that early morning sun, which is nice. Or evening. The old or the late evening, the dawn or the dusk. The older people, like my mother never wore a sunscreen. She does have a pigmentation. It's a different question. But, that's a familial pigmentation which runs in the family called melasma. She also has it. Some of her sisters have it. That is different. She would get it even if you wore a sunscreen, for example. But I'm saying they never ended up wearing a sunscreen. Their skin was fine. We end up wearing a sunscreen. So I can always argue and say, but my mom never, some people's moms have great skin. They can say, but my mom never wore it. But that day's food, the nourishment you got from the food, the pollution, the hole in the ozone was all different than what it is today. So it's much more harsher. My mom never used an AHA, BHA cleanser. You end up using that and walk into the sun, you're going to burn your skin. So contextually, it is very different today. Let us forget the ozone and the pollution. The number of things we are abusing the skin is not how my mom did it, right? At the most, what did they put? Banana on the skin, mm -hmm. honey on the skin. Like you said, maybe aloe vera on the skin was advanced. So that is it. We are putting God knows how many things on our skin right now. Teenagers, so I, 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 I have a habit of saying, carry all your sun, all your skincare when you come to me for the first consultation. I am shocked at the bag they bring in. <laughs> and some people have genuinely have 10 step regime. I'm like, do you really have the time? So, yeah, so we are abusing the skin. So you need extra protection. Then you can't say I will abuse and I will not protect. How will that work? Okay. Have you seen a modern day human with good skin, but who doesn't use sunscreen? Do you use sunscreen? No. Your skin is good. You're a modern day human. And I don't use it because I'm kind of lazy. That's all. There are many people like that. Like I'm saying, it's still okay. It's still okay. Like I said, are you then using an EHA and getting out in the sun? You're not. You're lazy, so you're not doing anything. So that is still okay. You can't disrupt and say, I will not protect. I mean, over the years, I figured the skincare that works for me. You're a Punjabi with good skin. Come on. I don't think I'm genetically uh, blessed with good skin. That is because you're talking of acne. Let's yeah. forget acne. Acne is one part of it. No, look at your skin on your hands, your fingers. They're fed. It's like a baby skin. That's Fantastic. the gate? Yeah. Really? This is, you have beautiful skin. How, how do you quantify that? One, your skin is not too thin. Like for example, my skin you're saying is beautiful when we started. I know it is a beautiful skin. I've got my dad's skin. But I can already see all my arteries and veins here, which is such a thin skin. I won't age well, no matter what I do. Because there's such a thin skin. 
But you, firstly, as a man, have a thicker skin. But even otherwise, your skin is nice and thick. I can see it's very even toned. Look at your knuckles. Look at your hands. They're nice and even toned. They they have a luminosity in it. So I know you're not putting junk into your gut. So wow, skin is. Wow, you can is, tell that much. Yeah, your skin is very well hydrated. Look at the little shine on your nose. Look at the little shine on your chin, your fingers. Your I usually first thing better than the face. I always look at their hands and their feet, because that is something which is most exposed. So I can see it at its worst. You've not put a cream and come. I don't know what you've put and come to me, right? So when I check, I'm always. I I have a table where they're sitting there. Obviously, bottom is just legs, so I can see their legs down. I see their feet, feet, their elbow, their hands, everything as it, and neck. These two, three things for me are very important to see. So, then I come to the hand scalp. Then I come to the face. So the face is obvious, but all of these contribute to I know your hygiene, then your skin, then your whatever you know issues. Then I know many things from just checking these many things. Wow. Okay, I never knew the hands and the feet are an indicator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. In the same way that you know, a lot of my female friends told me that the first thing they notice about a guy is the hands. Oh, really? It was such a shock for me. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh. but anyway, uh, hmm. coming back to skincare, for me, a lot of my skincare. This is just again my subjective experience. I don't know how true this is. This is something I discussed with Luke Coutinho at length. Hmm. I worked a lot on my physical flexibility, hmm. and I saw that that added Skin a improved. lot. Yeah. yeah. it does uh so i asked him why it happens he says that basically even your bones have in have an inherent amount of flexibility hmm. they're not meant to be fully hard they're slightly meant to bend no hmm. it's okay hmm. like you can hmm. i encourage disagreements hmm. on the show you have joints for it to bend bone itself won't bend no like there are cartilages in, around the some parts to bend not 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 bend i understand but even not even an ounce of flexibility will happen on strong bones when it starts to become flexible is when you see bow legs happening for older people which means it's a weak bone okay um okay okay let's mm. just talk about flexibility mm. in that case in general uh medically speaking when you're becoming physically more flexible firstly i would like to know what happens because till now i assumed it's this slight increase in bone flexibility other than the muscle flexibility and all that but his logic was that your bone marrow gets more stimulated over doing yoga in the long term that's why you'll see that a lot of people who do a lot of yoga their skin glows a lot like you'll see this difference hmm. is there any medical truth in the statement bone marrow getting stimulated with yoga i don't know i don't think there's any legit studies about it i don't know so i don't like to comment on what i don't know at all uh what does yoga do to you to get more better skin one from a deeper perspective it actually balances out your hormones it calms your mind once your mind is calmed a lot of stress hormones from the mind is released in a better way happy hormones are released so body is at a much better physiological state already so the skin gets better can we approach this thoda from a medical perspective mm. like my first statement to what you said is mm. what i've learned in yoga is that your parasympathetic nervous system correct. is getting correct. awakened correct the parasympathetic nervous system please correct me doctor hmm. is related to your state of relaxation also correct so effectively you stress are stress hormones are calm down yeah, you're using the levers of your body to calm yourself down that is one two okay medically because you're stretching and pulling and pushing there's a lot of blood release that's happening right so the tiniest vessels around your fingers also are getting full supply now mm. so you're getting a lot of nutrition there your all the waste is also better taken out and when you move the muscles all your muscles act like peripheral hearts so they pump and they pump and they pump back everything that is stagnated including your venous fluid extracellular fluid extra tissue fluid lymphatic fluid all this is gone back so your puffiness reduces and when the puffiness reduces again circulation gets better because there is no clogging so it is one leading to the other basically you get really detoxed better nourished better worked out that's all is what happens when you do exercise any form of exercise yoga in general because it's also calming in its nature uh i had a shoulder issue this last year for which mm. i went to a physiotherapist mm. they happened to correct my posture yeah. but they also happened to introduce me to this thing called lymphatic drainage massages correct where they massage my face in a particular way and then they right. also massage your arms and all that and it's like a 10 uh session course 
correct uh and after the lymphatic drainage massages the first day they said you'll probably just feel a little dizzy today I was actually feeling great i was kind of feeling high so, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i just felt that i didn't feel bad the second third fourth time they were like listen you got to sit down uh and today if uh your stomach gets upset or if you pee a lot then that means something has worked and i was like yeah that's not going to happen to me and it actually happened mm. and i was like what is happening here so i realized that there's some truth in what they were doing with that lymphatic drainage massage and i asked them that what's the visual indicator for you in terms of your lymphatic drainage massage is working so they said that usually acne reduces what is this crash i'm asking a dermatologist this and i actually saw that i mean i'm i'm not dealing with too much acne right now but my skin definitely was glowing mm. uh and i was feeling much better uh, there was a like that was one of the best things i've done for my body mm. that lymphatic drainage yeah. massage so do you have anything to say about this mm. like what was happening from a medical perspective inside my skin lymphatic drainage like i said in the previous answer what happens when you do yoga lymph also drains back so there's a lot of stagnation of that fluid which is the fluid that usually leaks from your blood vessels from your vein or your artery some fluid sometimes leaks why because everything is permeable right okay. so some leaks so those leaks are sitting in the tissue that is again scavenged from this tiny little white little pipes called lymphatic channels and they have little little nodes everywhere lymph nodes which drain 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 back to your heart back to the venous system so it is like it just collects whatever is left fluid the fellow who literally collects whatever is left and brings it back and dumps it back to the heart so he is the lymphatic guy now sometimes when you see puffy face puffy eyes puffy legs on people it is all because there is stagnation of lymphatic drainage may not be always lymph it can also be venous drainage but contribution is quite a lot from the lymphatic drainage as well that needs to be drained back a massage really helps in draining it opening the channels pushing it back what i have also seen in recent time is especially people who do a lot of fillers around the eye it's become a big thing in india tear trough they call it it's also called something like a trench under the eye and everybody fills it up and it looks like one big blue thing here and there's a lot of they, they would have poked it so many times that it would disrupt disrupted the lymphatics of this area so there's a lot of puffy eye and swelling so there are such fine channels if you keep poking if you keep irritating you disrupt them so massaging really helps them back for example in the face if you want to massage yourself these are where there is lot of lymphatics from here they all end up draining to peri- periauricular mm. preauricular lymphatic area so there's a lot of in front of the ear there's lymph so they will drain from here to here then from here to the neck there are a lot of glands here all over here there are glands so you drain then you drain the whole thing under the arm there is a lymphatic big lymphatic channels here glands here so like that and so on and so forth you keep draining everything so that is how a lymphatic massage is done it reduces puffiness therefore reduces inflammation as well does it is it a form of treatment i do for acne no not really because at that time i don't want to massage your face i want to leave it alone <laughs> i don't want to touch you yeah. but is that something that there is science behind it could there be lymphatic obstruction yes there is could the massage help yes it can there are experts who do lymphatic massages you could end up doing that it is very easy to learn in in number of youtube things which will teach you it's a simple thing to do it on your own for those people who feel very puffed up in the morning they can do their own little lymphatic massage and it really kind of helps just just kind of deep puff okay um in that whole skin care section we were discussing we mm-hmm. didn't touch upon retinol which has become very very popular i I've heard it's for fine lines, wrinkles, and it's kind of one of the most common anti-aging things now. Uh, mm-hmm. I have a lot of. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Do girls have skin that ages faster, faster. than male skin? Mm. Is does that happen? Mm. It happens. Mm. Why does it happen? One mm. and two. I'm asking you this because all my female friends who are my age uh, are all using retinol, and mm. they're talking about. how it actually have the acne also and all that i don't yes. know how much truth there is yes. in that it has yes. it yeah. Yeah. what how does retinol work should people be using it etc etc you can expand this huh. thought as much as you like so break down first what is retinol retinol is one of the precursors or some side step to retinol vitamin a simply put 
Now, this retinol is not a new ingredient. It is one of the oldest ingredient with maximum studies as an anti-aging one because it increases your cell turnover and changes the DNA of your basal cell in a way that it produces good cells, repaired cells and increases the cell turnover. So, it, it keeps bringing in fresh cells. So, the skin looks nice and fresh. Now, is it anti-aging? Yes, because it's increasing the cell turnover and taking out the dead cell from top. So, it kind of makes the skin look more youthful over a period of time. Should everyone use retinol? No, I have never put retinol on my face. I cannot handle retinol. Like it. My skin is super thin. If I use retinol, it will only, that turnover is not going to help me firstly, unless you really have like a thick skin to help the turnover. Two, I don't have a lot of clogged skin. I am exfoliating it regularly. Three, my skin is dry and sensitive. Putting retinol will only irritate my skin. There is no, not even easing my skin into it. I've tried even that. It doesn't work. So not all ingredients work for everyone. For me, a peptide is better for anti-aging, which are the proteins. What are we trying to build? More proteins and help the outer dead cell get better, right? So I'm inducing peptide as it. So I'm still continuing to work with retinol. Let me not digress. So retinol is not for everyone. Retinol works best for thicker skin type, acne prone skin, oily skin type works brilliantly well. Whereas a very thin skin, transparent skin, dry skin, I wouldn't really jump and use retinol on them. There are a lot more other anti-aging also available for them, which is easy to use. Easy on the skin as well. So that is that. And there is no downtime. There is no irritation. The next morning you're not wondering now, how do I cover this up? So therefore, they are not the retinol. They are the retinol types. They are not the retinol types. Now, the last question, does retinol also work on acne? Yes, it does. So how does it work? Same thing. What is your isotroin? It is one form of retinol itself. It's tretinoin. It's one form of retinol. It's an oral retinol. So that is something which is retinoid, we call it. Anyway, it's all similar cousins. Let's say they're all cousins. Same effect on the skin. Ha, same cousins. So on an acne also, it reduces the oil glands. It increases turnover. So the clogging reduces. Oiliness reduces. Skin kind of becomes much more nicer. The scar reduces because the turnover is increasing. But honestly, scar doesn't reduce. It's it's it'll, You'll have to apply a strong retinol for over two, three years for scar to reduce. There are better things to do now. You don't have to do that. So that's how it also helps acne. Okay. Is it a daily use product and can you use it for the rest of your life or should you, you only can. be... You can. If, like I said, if you, if you are the retinol kind, which I explained initially... If it feels happy on your skin, you can use it daily, use it rest of your life, no problem. But please understand, it is it is doing increased cell turnover and it is also slowing the top skin, like exfoliating it. So you need a strict sun protection the next morning. If it's somebody like you who says, I am lazy, I don't want to put sunscreen, please don't use retinol also. This is what I was trying to ask. Huh. Then what is the downside no. to this? So don't use retinol also. Either you do something in total, or you don't do anything because doing half will harm you and not help you. Okay, gotcha. Uh, do you want to give some precautions about hyaluronic acid as well? Hyaluronic acid, again, if you are the hyaluronic acid type, if you have a normal skin, calm skin, not an irritated skin, oily skin and just need that moisture, that hydration for your skin, your hyaluronic acid is your best friend. If you have a dry skin, sensitive skin, red skin, easily irritable skin, hyaluronic acid is not for you. Okay. Gotcha. All right. And for the final segment of this particular episode, <laughs> which I think is going to run into 30 minutes, honestly, yeah. and we won't end up doing the second episode <laughs> that we planned for today. But I want to ask you in detail about Accutane and isotretinoin. Got it. Because globally speaking, hmm. this is one of the most popular YouTube search terms related really? to acne. Yes. Wow. Since years, and I don't see that term dropping down in terms of popularity. Like how it's skincare, as with any other subject, there are trends. But when it comes to isotretinoin, Accutane, people are still as onto it as they were in 2015. Wow. Um, I don't have a single friend, at least in media, who's not to, had it at some point. Yes. Everyone's had it. Uh, I have friends who take it in perpetuity, 5 mg every day. Mm. Uh, can, can. Wow, really? <laughs> uh, Ma'am, maybe a great place to begin this would be WTF is isotretinoin. Like, what is it? What is the molecule? Like, why? And I've also taken it. 
it literally and this is in my phase where i was eating a lot of shit as well and had bad habits it just wiped out my acne correct so how did it work so effectively <laughs> i was i was shocked at how effective it was was it just that effective for me or is it actually effective for everyone everyone if you have an oil gland it will work okay. and if you have to have acne you have to have an oil gland correct so it will work now isotroin tretinoin acute rate whatever you call are either trade names or cousins of the same thing it is again vitamin a precursor like the retinol you applied on the skin this is edible fellow okay how does this work it dries out all your glands including your tear glands it can even cause dry vagina dry eye dry skin dry lip dry everything so basically this fellow will dry everything out and i think the one precaution is if you're trying to conceive you don't have it correct because any form of retinol is teratogenic which means it can cause harm to your baby in men also no no not in men there are recent studies which have shown it is not in men um so that is it blanket dries everything out so most of you who have been taking isotroin or tretinoin have realized that you have lip smacking lips go dry that's the first thing that happens right that's all is what it is doing it is drying everything why i don't give too much of retinol i do very rarely to my patients is one i don't want to dry everything out firstly you're trying to lubricate everything why are you drying it all out you're trying the hyaluronic acid you're trying this that and the other you don't need to dry everything out i do use it in an in a bad acne with hereditary acne where i have found no other cause to treat it is simply family your food is squeaky clean hormones are perfect everything is perfect and you have big painful cystic acne then i do use isotroin for a certain time i have used it i do use it but what i do is once i get a hand of it and control of it i don't see sense in drying you from even your hair falls hair becomes brittle dry all of that i don't see you drying from here to here to dry this much right so what we do is once i get it under control i start doing a procedure called micro needling radio frequency where we end up using tiny little needles get into your skin release radio frequency at different depths like a 2.2 or a 2 where i know the oil glands are situated so i'm shrinking the oil gland permanently Ooh. along with it as a side effect i am also treating your scars because i'm increasing collagen with the same procedure so why am i drying drying you out entirely when i can just dry this and dry it permanently for you so micro needling radio frequency therefore has become one of the most popular treatment in most doctors clinic but you need to do it in a right way to make sure your your no cause acne can be simply treated Damn. if there's a cause obviously you're first treating the cause like i said getting to a remission getting to that and then making sure it never comes back so why am i giving you isotroin because that can be hepatotoxic which means it can be toxic to your liver it can derange your lipid profile it could be teratogenic in a woman it could be so many things and i said it could dry you hair fall it can cause dry skin it can cause it can increase if you have eczema and cuts and dry skin lip smacking will cause lip pigmentation thereafter so there are ten things that can cause can cause ophthal complications so you don't want to give it but those are all quite rare if you're kind of you know not not that everybody gets it so please don't get scared if you're taking it your doctor would have thought of all this looked at all this and then given it to you having said that i would say this is how it is so if you have an oil gland isotroin will work on you okay after asking a podcasting question ha huh. so rude question so don't mind so how expensive is that treatment that you spoke about micro needling radio frequency one depends on the clinic you will go to which city you are going in depends on the doctor obviously doctors charge for the expertise uh three there is a consumable in it so depending on which machine you are using you will have a very small indian made machine to a korean machine to a chinese machine to a us fda approved machine depends on that it could be i think anywhere i don't know at my clinic it's i i don't know the cost the rates to be honest in my clinic somewhere if i benchmark it between 20 25 grand per sitting and how many let's say start off with four so minimum roughly 1 lakh, a lakh for a lakh is what safe... you're looking at it yeah yeah and i think when it comes to medical expenses people should i am not... i am very vaguely giving you this uh, yeah. benchmark figure because i'm also not 100% sure yeah but people should not try saving money when it comes to medical no, expenses no come on that that's something i'm glad you brought it up three things i want to tell specially for all the modern listeners here because dermatologist is so diluted and everybody claims to be a skin care expert today from a um, you know school dropout who can say i'm skin care expert on the social media to 
clinics which have opened up by either businessmen or someone 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 it's it's just diluted so one please don't go for deals i get really worried and angry when i see diwali sale in dermatology clinics i mean what are you doing so you can't be doing that so there is no deals there is no discounts there is no sale there is no anniversary sale you need to please go for this is not fashion this is really medicine this is if you give that respect to that it will treat you that respectfully back is what i feel respectfully back so you need to know this is not where you bargain this is not very where you look for cheap things yeah it's getting into your body it is going in there like there are people who come and say oh but in that clinic micro needling radio frequency was only this much for four sittings how do you know which machine how do you know that disposable that i'm attaching to it they are not i, I know many clinics reuse it you can't reuse it because there's a plastic component there is a metal component how would you sterilize it even if i put it in an autoclave the damn needle then gets blunt mm. you can't end up putting in then you 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 induce holes on the face for some people they come back and say we did micro needling that left holes in our skin that's because the needle might have not been sharp the depth might have not been right so there are so many things that you need to look so don't don't take it at face value don't take it at just acha kitna then i'm going to do it okay no um one question about isotretinoin again we spoke about that permanent usage of it it's mm-hmm. becoming very common in cities yeah, yeah. like maybe i'm here in verso right now that's why i'm saying that perhaps <laughs> yeah. but i hear this a lot yeah, yeah, lot of people yeah. use it permanently they use 5 mg yeah. every day there are some studies which say just a 5 mg isotretinoin can be like an anti aging pill it's a retinol at the end of the day it kind of helps the skin remodulate but that's a very nascent study i can't remember the exact study so i don't want everybody to take home this but my only point is like a 5 mg to keep it going may not harm you but make sure your doctor knows it so she is going to make sure your lipid profile is checked yeah. there is no toxicity out of it yeah but I, it's not an oh my god don't take it stop it right now no i wouldn't say that yeah um you know they say that one of the best things about earning money in life is that you get to create your own wardrobe and your own life yeah uh so but true. i also think one more factor to be added in this that you get access to some of the best healthcare treatments with the money you've made yeah. which is right i strongly believe in getting your blood and your your blood reports done your yeah. full body checkup done yeah. once every year at least get it in the like i keep saying skin is a reflection of your internal health so if something is going wrong with the skin a doctor has to give you time to completely look at what's happening mm. and healthy skin is going to remain in fashion forever yeah for sure okay uh i don't want to end this episode <laughs> i know this little more this little more questions yeah. about the peels ha yeah. what is a peel mm. you know all the shit i know because i've heard dated it. people from media who have gone to dermatologists otherwise i'm an engineering grad the yeah. first time i heard peel i was like why would you do that to your face uh, when you peel it off uh-huh. yeah now i understand yeah. a little yeah. bit more yeah. yeah with slightly incomplete understanding yeah. which we're going to correct today yeah so what's the peel <laughs> <laughs> so like you said it is a peel only but uh, what are you trying to peel is important so it could be Uh, depending on the depth that it peels your skin off it is very superficial superficial medium depth and deep peels when you say very superficial it literally takes away the top dead layer of your skin so you put the peel you remove it you just look that bit brighter so that's the just that's what it's doing a little deeper when it goes it becomes a let's say superficial peel where it may lead to a little redness or a little irritation for a very short time a medium depth peel may actually cause a little bit of rough and sloying skin but not really sloying away now deeper peels literally shrink and take away a portion of your skin so there depending on the depth of the peel like a very superficial you do it 20 minutes you are out of the clinic looking glowing happy go life is gone second level of the peel when you go a little deeper the doctor will tell you oh be a little careful don't go out in the sun don't do scrubs don't do rubs don't jump in the pool where there's a lot of chlorine nothing to irritate your skin for a week you take care of yourself by then the skin kind of recovers medium depth peel you will say oh my god 10 days strictly sun avoidance da 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 the deep peel you're literally bandaged for the first 7 days uh-huh. and then you have to stay in and so you will never see an indian do it because that is not for brown skin 
that is only for white western skin we don't even do i have never done one in my 22 years of practice i don't know how to do it one of my colleagues who i i really love her i've looked up to her when i was a younger dermatist dr marina landa i was just talking to her this morning she does these aggressive peels ripping away her eyes and all it's just gone but then beautiful it becomes but that's only possible for a white skin why that's we ph we pigment badly you can even scar badly if it is done badly that's a different question brown skin yeah brown skin pigments badly very badly because we ph very well there's this content of melanin in us which can just go left or right depending on its mood so it can either become fully dark or it can completely lose pigmentation and become white okay like the so, desi bias in me always assume that brown skin is healthier better than 100% 100% healthier and better in fact uh just now there is a study from northwestern university which says they have devised a synthetic melanin wherein they are applying imagine applying melanin on the skin we to hate our melanin in the skin they are applying melanin on the skin and they have realized it not only protects the skin from sun it also is wonderful at skin repair so they have seen it on a wound where the scabs fell off much sooner skin healed much sooner closed in much sooner so they are in fact now thinking of using it on burns patients to help kind of get the skin back quickly so melanin is a beautiful thing which is our brown skin that is why we don't burn like the west that is why we don't age like the west that is why we heal so much better it is all because thanks to our melanin okay uh you were saying about deep peel, peel. so peel not happening okay what we do in an indian scenario is just superficial peel very rarely medium depth that also none of us do it we do it like a concentrated one like a tca cross for acne scars that's the deep peel that you, medium depth peel that you end up doing literally in a toothpick we put one one dot on the scar only and that to a shorter period of time and tuck it's over medically what's very. happening there? then it'll just peel off a little uh, then the scar kind of closes in a little better a scar is basically your skin having different contours correct like now texture texture mm. uh it's khaddas like Khadda. it's, it's basically exactly. like Holes. a gap in your skin so when you're putting the peel i'm assuming it flattens it out by removing that the Khadda. cliff the the peak yeah the 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 the, the ice peak like that so imagine this is your acne scar and i'm taking a uh taking a toothpick dipping it into the bottle of my peel <gasps> that's literally candle oh my god <laughs> 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 dipping it into the thing and then dipping it back into this mm. so this entire cone i am peeling off and the raw skin will patchify oh okay okay okay, okay. understood like that it. but that is only that situation in general lightly what everybody keeps telling you oh, i did a peel and came back today blah, blah, blah. that is a very superficial peel where it could be vitamin c ferulic kojic azelic um, phytic hajar peels are there so we either use single peels or we combine the peels we depending on if it is acne usually it is salicylic mandelic that we end up using we can even use tc at a very low concentration blah blah, blah everything we end up mixing up and then it's literally like taking paint brush and painting it on your skin taking a q tip and applying depending on each doctor's technique we end up applying it some peels are sequential i'll apply one kind of a peel then i'll put on top on top on top to build up my peel or i'll do segmental peel which means your skin is not equal everywhere right this is oily this is dry this is dry this is pigmented for example and dry and dry most people indians i see this area is pigmented and dry though this is very oily so then i put a different peel different peel different peel that you got a segmental peel then we have a long stay peel certain peels like kojic peels retinol peels your retinol is also in a peel form we apply that and send them off home then they remove it after some 6 7 hours and slowly you will see peeling in the next 6 7 days and skin becomes nice and neat so there is a lot of uh, variations that we do in peel to give a lot of results usually it clears out your complexion clears out kind of a top dead layer so skin looks brighter cleaner acne scars fade out imperfections fade out uneven tones kind of blend in and fade out so various peels we do for various things. so that is a peel it's an office procedure come in go out okay um i don't know why i feel like asking you this now what but what do actors mainly come in for <laughs> 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 they just do yoga yes <laughs> yes no so i do have actors coming in male actors especially 
could be male and female. Actually, why am I saying male actors? Any one of them, hair, very big concern in them. As much as one would like to think it is skin, hair is a big concern. Like receding hairlines. Yeah, receding hairlines, thinning hair, burnt out hair. They keep pulling the hair, putting attachments, putting product every day. Imagine today, my daughter is going to watch this and shout at me. Saying, mom, couldn't you even do a blow dry? She hates my jungly hair. And I thought, oh, I don't want to put heat. She's like, yeah. yeah. She's like, what are you, look at you. I have South Indian frizzy hair and I've just come now and I don't know how I'm looking. The, anyway. It's also so, healthy hair. <laughs> healthy hair. <laughs> so, you know, you imagine blow drying every single day. And that too, it's not just blow drying to tame it. You have to make it sit a certain way. It means that much heat is put on it. You're blow drying, then you're ironing, then you're tonging, then you're doing 10 things. So literally all of them lose hair, poor things. So they all have, you know, kind of either brittle hair, dry hair, thin hair, hair that is going, going. So that is something that they come for hair, which is important. Skin, yes, you're an actor. You have to look your best. Gone are the days where you knew there is post-production, pre-production, makeup, light, enough. Today, there is papped at the airport, papped at the restaurant, papped in the promotions that they do. So they have to even look beautiful 24-7. So yes, they come to you for everything from a simple skincare regime to an acne to maybe pigmentation. And to remain young, to remain youthful, to remain having a perfect contour. The light has to take up your face well, right? It's, it's all about the light, what comes on your face and how it throws back, how your face looks. So they all want the face looking beautiful. How an actress, even at 35, 40, if she's looking exactly or rather subtly, if you trace them from the first release of their movie to now, you will see how slowly they've become prettier, youthful, lovelier, but I can definitely vouch for my work that you can never say what I've done. So mostly they come in for that. Some, the bad work is what you can actually point out, to be honest. The wow. good work, you will never be able to tell. You will never be able to tell. It just looks like, oh, they've done good skincare, but I'd have done hajar things. When someone's had plastic surgery on the face, does skincare also change? Skin care may not change if you do a plastic surgery because if you look at the younger artist, if someone has done a plastic surgery, it could be rhinoplasty, which is their nose, for example. I know of a few, let's say, male artists who have also done something for their chin, which is not necessary now to put an implant because we do a beautiful jawline and creation of a chin with just fillers, which is a one second job where you don't have to go in for a surgery. And it, as against the popular belief that, oh, we have to keep doing it, karte rena padega. no, fillers, when it is a well done job, when I say, first, if I say, I usually don't do everything at one sitting, I take them two stages and, and say, okay, now I'm done. Then I, many a times I don't do anything more for the next five years. So, changing the face contour is something we can do. But post-plastic surgery, why will it change? Because even if you've done something for your nose, for example, or done something for the chin, skin, skin is still is the, the same. same. Even, for example, an old artist has gone, let's say, to get a face lift done. A part of her skin is cut off because they have pulled and pegged it up, but the rest of the skin is still there. It is the same skincare which will continue. Same skincare, meaning to say not what she's doing in the teens. Obviously, we're changing skin according to her age, but pretty much. Okay. So again, there's no one single answer to this question of what do actors come in for? Even their skin Simply is Simply a glow skin, they might come because every day they're putting makeup, it is light, it is dehydrating. So there are a lot of people, I simply do biostimulatory injections which is like a hyaluronic acid, your favorite ingredient, which we just inject under the skin. Doesn't change the contour of your face, doesn't change it. Just gives you that dewy look. So even for acne scars, it works wonderfully. Gives you that dewy look, stretched skin, that alabaster skin that you have. It gives you that because it's well hydrated. And along with hydration, it stimulates your own collagen elastin and gives you ground substance. So we call it biostimulators. Okay. Are these things painful? No, you have no idea what all people can take for looking beautiful. Like one of my patients was saying, Ye agar if this was a tetanus shot, I would have run out and made, brought the clinic down. You're poking on my face. Look at me how beautifully I'm sitting. So one, they take it for that. Two, if I can say so myself, I have been told, I have a patient, I have a lot of patients who come internationally because they also have work done here, there, there. They always say I have the smoothest hand. It just doesn't hurt when I inject. And I take pride in that. So it just doesn't hurt. Plus, in general, we use extra fine needles. We use like a 30 gauge needle, 34 gauge needle I use when I'm injecting onto the scalp, which is your general hospital may when they give you IV and all, they give you 18 gauge needle. 
as as the number goes higher it is thinner 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 so i'm using 34 gauge needle which you can't even see sometimes so not to worry what is the most painful skin care treatment the deep peel all therapy all therapy mm. all thera is the machine all therapy is the treatment which is a highly focused ultrasound commonly known as hifu again people say the technology name and they have lesser machines but Althera is the gold standard most expensive best machines with the maximum number of studies therefore you are accurate when you're delivering something you're getting that result so therefore you go for better machines Althera is very painful i don't know why patients do it but i know why they do it once i tell them the first time they say oh we heard it's painful then when i do it Every year, they quietly come and sign on themselves saying, okay, now I, it's time for my all therapy. What is it for? It's for skin tightening and lifting. It's an amazing machine. I do that on my own face every year. And guys, I'm, I have no financial interest in the machine. I'm just telling you. So I do that for myself every year because that's how you can... I'm otherwise a nice, regular, round-faced South Indian. I'm 50 and I have a clean jawline, which is, I think... Lots is to do with how I am. You maintain your weight. You make sure you're slim. You make sure you're healthy. There's no water retention. Along with all that, you need to also have your skin tightly wrapped. Mm. Now that for me, an all therapy really helps every year of me doing. So I always tell people, if someone is doing and someone is not doing, you can see the difference in eight, eight nine years, how their skin has panned out and how. And there's multiple studies done internationally with identical twins to say, one has done some treatments, one hasn't, and how they age. And it's it's amazing how they age when it is when it is done well. You can still age so to me, graceful aging is when you age looking like yourself, but taking that little help of science and taking care. It's it's graceful aging, not just letting yourself all go. But if you want to do that, good for you. I'm not judging, but I'm saying, yeah, you can age gracefully with things done. Aging gracefully doesn't mean that you age without things done. And it does have psychological implications. In terms of yeah. skincare, I remember my mom telling me after eye surgery. I said, "Mom, how's how's your uh, how how are you feeling now?" She's saying, "What's the whole point? Now I can see every act, every wrinkle on my face and feels bad, feels aged." So it's such a you know clarity of vision made her see her lines <laughs> which she didn't have earlier. Her first the first observation is, "Wow, my vision is clear." That's what I was expecting. Instead, she. She was actually feeling disappointed that her face is aged. So it has definitely a psychological implication on, it's like a, it's like a saying of good hair day, right? So when your skin feels good, you are a better person to yourself, you're happier, your output is better, you're better to the other person, his output becomes better. So it's like a chain reaction of a good day. I'm blown away by Thank even you. this subject mm. in general. Mm. Um, it's, it's so important for people to know these things mm. because I didn't know all this until I moved to Varsova. <laughs> <laughs> and started because, living among the Alter piece. Yeah. <laughs> I was just an engineering yeah. grad. But I remember um, mm. my co-founder mm. saying, like I used to wear glasses and I could never wear contact lenses because my eyes were just sensitive. Uh, and it used to actually add a charm like in terms yeah. of like, I used to be looked at as a nerd, which and was great. We all love nerds. Um, huh? But when I got my glasses removed through Smile, S-M-I-L-E, mm. which is the, you know, like it's, it's like LASIK, it's Correct. advanced. Correct. Um, I did it very impulsively because I couldn't read teleprompters. Yeah. That was my actual reason. Mm. I was like, no, dude, I'm sick of this. Like mm. teleprompters make a media person's life very easy. Easy. Otherwise you have to ratta maro the whole stuff. All the thing. Hmm. So that was my intention. But when my glasses came off and I had a pretty high number, my number was five on both eyes. Oh. Which meant I couldn't even wear stylish glasses. I had to wear like... Thick one. It had to hold the glass. Thickness. Yeah. The frame. Mm. It, anyway, I, I still always look nerdy. Yeah. Um, when my glasses came off, I saw how people treated me different. Huh. Yeah. Huh. And I realized, okay, wow, this is... This is why people go in for plastic surgery also. <laughs> <laughs> then it made sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Which is why now in yeah. Varsova, when I hear about skin-based uh, treatments... A past version of me would have judged, judged it yeah. as many Indians do. Sat on do. a high horse, yeah. So yeah that, no, not oh, for me. Why? Oh my God. Exactly. Very vain. Not yeah. at all. Like, yeah. you know, stick to the satric yeah. life. Why do you want to do these things? Yeah. Exactly. But the thing is, when you go through one of those treatments and you see how it's changed the reality of your life, you understand the value of modern day science. To add to more than just that, it's like sex education. 
Now, if you don't educate people what is out there and what can be done, they will do it, hush, hush, and it'll all be done wrong. Correct. So to me, it's like, I know of children who've gone and done their lip jobs in bad places. Children? I would call a 16, 17 children, right? They would have gone and done lip jobs in bad places. One, not just is the aesthetic outcome bad, there could be serious complications of death of a tissue. When you do fillers in a wrong way or in an unqualified or an untrained hand. So you need to be very careful and please, the next time you go to your doctor, please don't ask how much is it per unit and how much is it per syringe. This is not budgie you're buying. So it is so important. Therefore, I think this education is important for you to understand laser is not a blanket statement. There are million equipments. It's a category of energy-based devices, which could be radio frequency, laser, highly focused ultrasound, like Altera we were talking, million other things there. So education is very important. Otherwise, our children, the young individuals who, who today in the pressure of the society want to look good and people who are just tilting the age, who I know a lot of people who come and tell me, thank you so much. You have changed my confidence. I have people crying after I finish the work and thanking me and saying, you have no idea what you have done and what con I thought Gaia, I remember this Hindi sentence one lady said, I to socha abhi Gaia life, kya hai? Chehra dekho, ho gaya abhi. But thank you for what you end up ended up doing to my face that I feel I still can go out and live and be happy. It, it, you may find it very trivial, but it is true when you come there, like you said. Now, out of this pressure, whether it is a teenager or an adult, you don't want them going misinformed and going into small lane and quietly doing something. You want them to be informed. You want them to know what it is. Now, whether you want to take or not is your perspective. Like how you don't want to body shame a person who is, who is whatever, let's say big in size or who is something, something. Don't body shame a person who wants to do Botox. It's okay. I have a zillion more questions in my head, honestly, about mm. aging, fillers, uh, all these other treatments. So we, we can actually break down from both yeah. a biological perspective and mm. a cosmetic perspective. Mm. But we'll do that the next time. <laughs> Dr. Rashmi Shetty, that's the end of this episode. Uh, I know <laughs> that you get asked these questions a lot, yeah. but uh, uh, it was a very important episode for the internet. Yeah. Like if I had this episode in my hands at age 22, yeah. my 20s would have been different. Yeah. Which is my major intention yeah. during this particular episode. Yeah. So thank you. And I'm sure you're solving problems constantly but you've also solved a lot of people's problems today especially young adults thank you who are going through major psychological issues yeah because of however yeah. the skins are reacting to life yeah i'd also like to put a disclaimer which is kind of a throwback to what you said at the start of the podcast mm. that chill out yeah like you know don't don't it's okay take skin problems so seriously it's 2023 it's all solvable uh, but learn your body. Like, I think a majority of the issues I had and the majority of the issues I see around me basically boil down to people not understanding how their body works and not seeking medical help. Yeah, fair enough. These two factors. Fair enough. While you're doing that, as a closing sentence, I want to reiterate and say, don't traumatize yourself with skin issues. If there is an acne, if there is a wrinkle, if there is a line, a pigment patch, so be it. Don't let that dampen your confidence and spirit. At the same time, like you said, seek the medical advice. Can be done. But just, just don't bother. It's just a bloody pimple. Yeah. And, you know, everyone's skin has trouble. Like, including, Surely. including like the biggest superstars that you know. Yeah. They're all, every, every human who's born in our world is going through the same problems you've gone through recently. So true. So, there's too many people watching this probably crying right now. Uh, yeah. just at the end of this conversation I wish when I was dealing with my skin trouble when I was 22, 23 and didn't know what's happening I wish someone had told me these things yeah. so I'm just glad I get to do it at age 30 for other people yeah. and I'm sure there's a part of you that feels yeah. that as well because I know that the biggest gift of a doctor's career is how you can change people's lives so true I, I have to tell this one thing I remember after my MBBS for a long for a, for a year I was working in the ICU as a as a, um, not an intern, what do you call it? I had a post, ICU post. So I was working there as a resident. And uh, I used to love it. You know, you finish your ICU duty and come out as against a ward doctor 
where when you're a ward junior doctor, you're just calling the doctor saying, doctor's coming on rounds, you're writing down notes and just do, making sure that's done well. In an ICU, when things go wrong, you first treat. Then you call the senior consultant to say, sir, I've done this, this, this. What do you think? He will change a little or do a thing. He'll come for rounds a little later. So the power that you have as a doctor, as a clinician is real. You're doing it. You're saving the life. So when you finish your that 12-hour duty and when you walk out, you will see those relatives standing. And you know, they'll come and they'll say, how's my dad? How's my mom? How's your child? Whatever, whatever. And they look at you like as if you are God who's walked out. And next day when you walk into the ICU again, they'll say, will you please look at her? Will you please tell this? It's, it's, it's a beautiful feeling. And at the same time, I couldn't handle it because I get very emotional with everything. I get very attached to my patients. So I had to get out of that. Then I got into dermatology studies and then I, I'm a dermatologist today. Somewhere along the line in dermatology, I remember coming home once and crying with my daughter and saying, you know, I don't feel like a doctor anymore. I don't think I'm saving lives. So Uppu says, Ma, you're not looking at it. You're looking at it wrongly. Look at the amount of patients who come and thank you. You've saved people's confidence, their marriages, their extended their careers, their confidence have changed. You've no idea what you're doing. You may not be saving the life, but you're saving the quality of their life and enhancing it and making them live so well now. So I'm just saying this to say, don't look down upon someone who's wanting to look beautiful or wanting to have a good skin and good hair. Help them, guide them. That's, that, that issue is real. Yeah. All I'll say in the end yeah. is that you're not a dermatologist, you're the dermatologist today. Okay. So, uh, ma'am, I hope to speak to you again. There's lots yeah. more to like unpack. Yeah. This is just an intro to dermatology. Yeah. So I appreciate your time you. and your presence and all your skincare <laughs> tips. Thank you. So, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So that was the episode for today, ladies and gentlemen. But as I said, at the end of this particular podcast, this should reach maximum people because so many people are dealing with psychological trauma because of cosmetic issues. And when it comes to cosmetic issues, everything is solvable. That's what we tried doing on this episode. We just tried putting a lot of free of cost knowledge out there. I sincerely hope that it reaches the people who need this kind of knowledge. Of course, Dr. Rashmi Shetty is going to be back on the show very, very soon. The next time we'll talk a little bit more about aging, anti-aging, Botox, fillers, uh, modern day cosmetics, a lot of other stuff. Please tell me in the comment section what you'd like us to cover in that particular episode. I'm super pumped about having multiple conversations with the legendary doctor. But for now, that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you very soon on TRS.